action, action plan, which tells us the actions that we have to take every year. And it focuses on three different lines of activity. So first, uh, make sure that the resource distribution, there are no biases there, that the evaluation and the, and the follow up of the various projects that we, that we found uh, take into account the criteria of gender, of gender equality to avoid uh, gender bias and, and so on and, and so forth. And very, very importantly, and perhaps the most, the most important point is um, focusing on the research careers. Uh, the research careers have to take, the evaluation of the research careers have to take into, into account circumstances, personal circumstances, gender circumstances, paternity, maternity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is now strictly adhered to, something that is taken absolutely into account. And in, 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 in recent years, there has been a, a move towards um, sidestepping somehow the quantitative criteria or purely bibliometric criteria to evaluate researchers. So we, ha we have subscribed, we adhere to the dollar agreement that calls for a more personalized, a, a more qualitative assessment of research. And I, also, I think that this also goes absolutely in the direction of gender, gender equality. Uh, we are still in the first steps of implementing this, uh, dollar, this dollar agreement. Is not easy because there are many habits, there are many routines that are sort of hardwired in, 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 in the research, um, in the research assessment. But it will get, will get there. And as I said, this will have a very positive, very positive impact in, uh, in, in the line of gender, gender uh, equality policies. So this year, 2022, and with that, I'm going to to conclude. Uh, we want to advance, as I said, in a more equilibrated and, and parity-oriented uh, composition of our uh, collaborators in all the committees that uh, proceed to the selection and, eva and, and evaluation. We will continue. Uh, we are producing material um, for our evaluators to take into account uh, gender equality policies. And not only inside our evaluators, we also want to provide and educate, in a sense, our whole research community about how to uh, prepare research proposals that take into account the gender perspective. This comes uh, as a new thing to many, to, to many other people, they are well aware of the, of the issues involving in gender, gender equality policies, uh, but nevertheless, we want to make sure that as much as possible, these uh, ideas are applied not only inside the agency, the funding agency, but using our, um, our duty to evaluate the research proposals to make sure that these policies uh, permeate in the whole research community. As I said, this uh, change will not happen one day overnight, okay? This is uh, something that you have to keep working uh, continuously, insisting, and I think that we are certainly moving in the, in the good direction. As I said, the same example in the beginning, where you know, we have this big steam locomotive, takes a while to, to move. When it moves, it gets there. So, so with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, again, I, I would like to thank to Maria and all the whole, the whole collaboration. I think you have been doing a, a great work. I think it's a work that we need. Yeah, it's a work that we need. Even if sometimes we already somehow know uh, what, uh, what we should be doing, it's good that somebody reminds you that, yes, we should be doing it. So thank you very much. And I wish you have a, a very fruitful and a great uh, closing day for this for this project and thanks to the uh, also to the hospitality of the Universidad Complutense. My rector will give my give my regards to, to, to your rector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your lecture. And now is the turn on Athanasia Mongo. She's online. 
Good morning. Yes, I'm online. Uh, I was wondering if you can share my slides because uh, I cannot. Uh, I have a message that I'm uh, that I cannot uh, screen share. This is what uh, we discussed earlier. But in the meantime, I just wanted to say that uh, it's great also to hear your commitment towards gender equality and to be here at the final conference of uh, Supera. Supera is uh, also one, uh, is one of our success stories, success projects, if I may say, and uh, you have done a lot of great work. And it's also the great time to, a good time to celebrate all the achievements that you have uh, accomplished. And it's also really nice to see that uh, you're, uh, you have also foreseen a, a physical meeting. So this, uh, this still seems to us a bit, um, a bit nice and as, uh, as we used to be before. Okay, this is great. Thank you very much. Um, perfect. Uh, just, uh, I would just, I'm here to replace actually my colleague, Mina Sareva, who unfortunately couldn't uh, be here today. But um, I would just like to give you a brief overview of uh, our policies on gender equality in research and innovation. And first of all, I would like to start by saying that uh, our common policy framework is the European research area. And since uh, 2012 already, gender equality and gender mainstreaming uh, have been one of the era policy priorities with uh, three underpinning objectives. Those are to achieve gender equality in scientific careers at all levels, uh, having gender balance in decision-making bodies and positions and integrating the gender dimension into research and innovation content. So in order to achieve uh, to achieve all these objectives, we have one common approach that is uh, having institutional change in research organizations to fix, to fix the problem, the system. And uh, all the positive uh, impact and all the knowledge that was also produced by projects and our stakeholders like projects like Supera have also led, uh, as you all know, to the introduction of gender equality plans as an eligibility criterion for Horizon Europe funding. At the same time, at uh, the ERA communication of 2020, it was also highlighted that we also need to address inclusiveness. That means here inclusiveness has uh, three angles. First, we need to also look beyond gender to look at uh, intersecting social categories such as ethnicity, sexual orientation and disability to involve uh, the private and the innovation sector and to also ensure geographical inclusiveness, to make sure that all of the European member states are on board for these institutional change. So now if we can go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, recently, this, uh, this ambitious approach that we have uh, has also been uh, supported by member states that uh, are actually the key players facilitating institutional change. For instance, already back uh, at the end of November last year, there was an ambitious package that was adopted in the Competitiveness Council uh, that include, first of all, a pact for research and innovation in Europe. And in this pact, uh, gender equality and inclusiveness was established as, uh, well, was highlighted. It was already established as a principle and the core value of the European research area. We also had uh, the ERA policy agenda that included 20 voluntary actions to be implemented by European member states and the Commission. And we have specifically an action to promote gender equality and foster inclusiveness, taking note of the Ljubljana Declaration. Uh, the Ljubljana Declaration in particular highlighted a strengthened commitment towards gender equality and also stressed out uh, the fact that we need to also look at uh, intersectionality, go beyond to look at inclusiveness to ensure gender equal careers for our researchers. 
And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see here related to this uh, to this action that I just mentioned on promoting gender equality and in fostering inclusiveness. We have four outcome deliverables that essentially represent our priorities. First of all, we have, uh, for instance, the development of a policy coordination mechanism, as well as a dedicated uh, European network on their implementation. Uh, we also need to look at uh, having a strategy on gender-based violence and sexual harassment, and also to in cooperation with uh, the national research funding organizations, uh, having principles for the integration and evaluation of the gender perspective in research and innovation content. Uh, if we go to the next uh, slide, we can. Uh, I will talk a bit about uh, very briefly about uh, the, the provisions regarding gender equality in Horizon Europe. Gender equality is a strong, is a, a strengthened cross-cutting priority in the framework program. Uh, we have three levels commitment at three different levels. Europa, First of all, as you all know, we have, we have uh, gender equality plans uh, that, uh, that have become an eligibility criterion for public bodies, research organizations, and higher education institutions. I'm sorry, I also hear my, my voice. Perdón, I, will, uh, también oigo mi voz, eh, y... I will just uh, remove the headphones. And Voy a simplemente quitarme los, los cascos. So gender equality plans are an eligibility que... criterion for public bodies, research organizations, and higher education This is actually a requirement by default, unless it's very well specified that it is not relevant. Que no sea relevante. Yes, exactly. I can also see the chat. Uh, sí, we, exactly. I think in the chat we can hear both. Oímos los dos idiomas. We can hear both. It's uh, not possible to mute the Supera. No sé si es posible mutear la oficina de Supera. Okay, I will uh, try try to go through this again. Apologies also if it was a bit confusing because I was talking at the same time. Uh, so just to say uh, again that gender equality is a strengthened cross-cutting priority in Horizon Europe. We have um, gender equality plans that are now an eligibility criterion for public bodies, research organizations, and higher education institutions in any European member state and associated countries. And uh, the, the integration of the gender dimension into research and innovation content is now mandatory by default. And finally, gender balancing research teams is one of the ranking criteria for proposals that have received uh, the, same, uh, the same score. And uh, for uh, the first time, we also, researchers can uh, actually declare their gender using a third category they have the option of non-binary, which is also one step uh, further towards um, opening up uh, a bit and going beyond uh, women and men. If we go to the next uh, slide, please. That's great, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, we support in order to show how we also support gender equality plans in, uh, in practice. First of all, we have uh, the gender equality in academia and research tool, the GEAR tool that's currently being updated. You will see this update. Um, it will be available quite soon in the upcoming uh, weeks. And we have also mobilized a pilot European uh, knowledge and support facility on institutional change through gender equality plans. We have also published uh, guidance specifically on CHEPS 
that includes uh, concrete examples on the recommended areas to be covered by JEPS and also the key building blocks. And we also have some good examples by SPERA in this, uh, in this guidance. There are also online trainings to organizations, to countries with the organizations that do not currently have a lot of gender equality plans into place. And uh, actually today we are already, we are giving a training for Romanian universities and there are more that will follow. Um, and we're also working towards having a network of national JEP contact points across European member states and associated countries. And finally, there are many, many activities and useful material by our Horizon 2020 gender projects, including SPERA. And as I said also before, uh, SPERA is one of our success stories. We're fully aware also of everything that you have, uh, you have done, your communication activities. And um, just congratulations, it's, uh, you have done a lot. If, you, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, also at the DGRTD, at DG Research and Innovation, we're, we're also working, we're having some studies in order to, to move beyond and to progress on our gender equality policies. Just to give you an example, we have uh, already launched a study on inclusive and intersectional gender equality policies. We're also looking at the impact of COVID-19 on uh, researchers because it might seem a bit uh, behind us, but still its uh, impact is, uh, I, I be, we believe that it's uh, also here. And uh, we're also having a study on the, the impact of uh, European and national policies, especially for uh, gender equality plans. If we can go to the next slide, please. I would like to highlight here some of our uh, actions that uh, are funded through our WIDERA, Widening and Strengthening the European Research Area, work program for 2021 and 2022. Uh, we have, from last year, we have two proposals that are currently into their grant agreement preparation phase. First of all, we have a center of excellence on inclusive gender equality in uh, RNI will act uh, as a think tank and provide recommendations. And uh, there is also a policy coordination scheme to advance the implementation of uh, gender equality and inclusiveness objectives. For this year, uh, there are two calls that are currently open. First of all, we have a living lab for gender responsive innovation. And uh, we also have uh, a call for in order to support the implementation of inclusive gender equality plans. Those, uh, both of these uh, topics are actually open until uh, 20th of April. So it's, uh, it's also good to, to keep in mind and have also added the links there so you can have a look into detail. Some other actions that are also in the work program is uh, a European Gender Equality Competence Facility and the European Award for the first time for Gender Equality Champions. And uh, you, there will be more, more details about this uh, in the upcoming weeks and uh, months. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, finally, I would uh, like to close a bit with our, uh, some data from our flagship publication, C Figures. As you already mentioned, we can see that there is progress uh, being made. We can see that there's almost uh, gender parity at doctoral graduate level. However, when we look at uh, different uh, fields of study, we can see that the women are still underrepresented. For instance, if we look at uh, information communication technology, technologies or in fields like engineering. And then as we also go higher into the academic ladder, we can see that uh, women still make up one fourth of academics that hold uh, full professorship positions. So as you said, uh, this, uh, this, has, uh, this, this has to change. Uh, it requires a lot of effort and uh, change will not happen from one day to the other. 
but uh, this is what we're working on. And if we go to the next slide, please. For this edition, uh, I would just like to highlight that we had uh, included some policy briefs also on our uh, C figures. These are uh, themes that are of interest to our to the scientific community and to policymakers. And if you would like to to have a look, to have a look at those, and we also publish some country pieces where you can see also how your country is performing in terms of gender equality. And uh, to wrap up, if you can go to the next uh, slide, please. For more updates, uh, you can also visit our gender equality in research and innovation policy webpage. This is also where we, where we add all of the latest news and also information about uh, future trainings. And uh, you can also find all of our publications and policies. And uh, if we can go to the final slide, I would uh, like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, to also congratulate you on all the work that uh, you have done. As I said earlier, Supera is one of our success uh, stories projects and uh, Today is also a day to, to celebrate on your achievements. And uh, yes, discuss also what, uh, what can be done further. Thank you very much. And I wish you very nice uh, discussions. Thank you very much for your lecture. Bueno, podríamos resumir todas las intervenciones que hemos tenido en esta apertura eh, diciendo que, bueno, pues estamos en camino, estamos en marcha, que la situación de partida mm, es complicada porque, bueno, partimos de una situación anterior donde, partiendo de la base que, que el mundo de la investigación y de la profesión académica es complicada para, para todos, eh, absolutamente para todos. Es un trabajo duro, de largo recorrido y claro, en el caso de las mujeres, pues tenemos otros recorridos también en paralelo y esto pues nos ha dificultado nuestra presencia, en, nuestra presencia digamos, eh, al nivel que nos debería corresponder en de determinados ámbitos, tanto a nivel de decisiones políticas, tanto a nivel de, de cargos de dirección, tanto a nivel de formación de las comisiones que tienen que tomar determinado tipo de decisiones y luego también, bueno, pues eh, dentro de lo que es en sí el, los diferentes puestos de, de investigación y también de, de docencia. Pero una vez que se ha hecho este primer estudio por parte de los diferentes protagonistas, tanto a nivel de centros de investigación, como es el caso de las universidades, cuan, como a nivel de las agencias de financiación de la investigación, tanto agencias nacionales como los programas europeos, pues viendo las circunstancias en las que estamos, pues ya se, están, se han empezado a tomar medidas que se están implementando y que entre todos pues lograremos que, que la situación cambie. Eh, entiendo que, que no es que vaya a ser difícil, pero tampoco va a ser fácil ni si va a llevar al ritmo que todos nos gustaría, que todos desearíamos. Pero si todos los actores responsables a su vez son conscientes y están implicados, pues yo creo que el éxito está, está asegurado, porque el entusiasmo por parte de, de todos pues es, eh, es importante, ¿eh? y sobre todo la concienciación de que, de que esto tiene que cambiar eh, es muy importante, y bueno, pues eh, digamos que es la parte fundamental para que efectivamente se produzca el cambio lo, lo antes posible. No sé si alguno de los presentes quiere preguntar. ¿Es there any question? Pues si os parece podemos terminar, hacemos un pequeño break, receso y ya después se continúa. Muchas gracias.
Okay, now can you? Ay, pero está compartiendo pantalla. Is, we, we, are, we are waiting a little bit for keeping the time for the people online. So as we were set to start at 10.30, we are just keeping the, the time, okay? Um, en español estamos esperando, de acuerdo, a, a, que, a que sean las diez y media porque la gente online tiene un horario conocido. Gracias.
Okay. Okay, so we are going we are going to start um, our session. First, um, I would like uh, to start this uh, uh, presentation by uh, thanking um, the UCM Vice Rector Margarita San Andres and Dominic uh, Espriu, Director of the Spanish National Research Agency, for the institutional uh, support to Supera and uh, its final event. Thank you also to the gender sector in the DG Research and Innovation in the European uh, Commission. Thank you to An Athanasia uh, uh, Gungu. And um, of course, uh, we uh, wish a, a speed recovery to uh, Mina Stareva that uh, had a health uh, uh, issue and could not be with us as uh, what uh, planet. Um, the gender sector is doing, as you can uh, see, a great um, work uh, in the continued support uh, to gender structural change uh, projects as super. Um, dear friends and, and, and colleagues, uh, dear all, uh, welcome to this super final event beyond tick in the box, sustainable, innovative and inclusive gender equality uh, plans. Um, welcome to all the ones that are here in presence and also uh, hello and welcome to all the people online. We have almost uh, uh, 200 people registered um, with the people here, uh, almost two, uh, 250 people registered. And of course also hello if someone is also following us uh, through the stream, uh, streaming um, as through the UCM director, okay? Um, I, I would just to say that um, here we will have the opportunity um, uh, for the people in the uh, here uh, to have some questions and comments, uh, but for the people online, please use the chat. We are uh, doing that. We are working on receiving your comments, questions, uh, and we will do that uh, throughout the, 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 the day. So uh, I, of course, I welcome you on behalf of the Supera Consortium. I mean, Maria Bustelo, the coordinator um, from the uh, Complutense University. But of course, we have this wonderful consortium that we have been working together. Um, we have, as, as the vice rector said, uh, four universities. And uh, of course, I would like to Welcome and welcome you on behalf of them. So Central European uh, University, um, um, thank you, Andrea Christian and Anabelena Amil for uh, being here. We have the University of Cagliari with a wonderful representation uh, uh, in the Supera team. We have two delegates of the rector and some vice rectors and, and people. So Luigi, uh, Rafa and all, the, and all the team, hello and thank you. Uh, for um, uh, being uh, here. Uh, we have SES University of Coimbra, uh, uh, Monica Lopez, and thank you so much, Claudia Cavados, Vice Director of Research uh, from the University of Coimbra, who is also uh, with us. And um, we have also uh, two research funding organizations. We have the RAS, the Autonomous uh, uh, Region of Sardinia, Massimo Carboni, thank you uh, for being uh, here. And um, as part of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the consortium too, uh, we have the Spanish National Research Agency through the Ministry of uh, Research and Innovation. And thank you, Zulema Altamariano, for being here. And Lidia, uh, 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 Lidia González for um, in on behalf of FECIT, the Foundation uh, FECIT. So, um, and of course, we have also two wonderful supporting uh, partners, uh, Yellow Window, and thank you, Lut Mergaert and uh, Alain Denise, uh, in, uh, for supporting us with training and methodology and innovation, and uh, Science Po and Maxime uh, Forest, our evaluator uh, partner. 
So uh, welcome, uh, welcome, and of course, uh, thank you also to our International Advisory uh, Board and uh, Jörg Müller uh, is here and the others are online, finally uh, uh, online. And uh, of course, to our friends and uh, colleagues uh, from other sister projects and institutions who have accepted our invitation to share with us today their inspiring practices and knowledge. So to all of you, uh, uh, hello and welcome. Supra is uh, finally coming to an end after four years of being working uh, together. <laughs> what four years? Um, we can say that it has been a long and winding road. Uh, there have been import important uh, institutional and political changes in all of our six implementing partners. And the pandemic uh, caught us when we were reaching the midst of the project and were just finishing the takeoff and reaching the cruising period. And then we uh, started with the pandemic. All these circumstances made us uh, be constantly adapting our interventions and change processes, and also made us highly resilient. But it, it, it has also been a fabulous adventure full of efforts, achievements, successes, and inspiring practices of which we are proud. We will present a selection of them uh, today, and several more will be presented in our two last public deliverables, guidelines, uh, and best practices for research performing organizations and for research funding organizations, which will be ready at the end of the project this coming month of May. SuperA was designed and has been developed under four principles, cumulativeness, innovation, inclusiveness, and sustainability. The first uh, principle we wanted to observe from the de design and inception of the project was cumulativeness. This idea was about taking advantage of what was already there not trying to reinvent the wheel. So Supra was drawn upon tools and instruments already experimented and evaluated by other experiences and structural change projects. The second one, innovation, made us develop innovative implementation structures using transformation design techniques, which were thought for designing, prototyping, and testing affordable and innovative policy solutions to gender bias and imbalances identified through gender audits and diagnosis. The third one, inclusiveness, means that we think that the only way for reaching a real structural change is through the involvement of the research and university communities. That is why in Supera we have emphasized the importance of using participatory techniques and active involvement. And this really, as, as this really increases the support, uh, the, their support to change processes and helps to reduce resistances. The last one, sustainability, shows our commitment from the beginning of the project to design, implement, and evaluate interventions whose results have chances to endure over time, producing gender structural change in our institutions. For securing this sustainable institutional change, we have done efforts towards project top management endorsement, visibility of actions, and the promotion of long-term involvement promotion. The last principle, this last principle of sustainability is the one we propose as, as leitmotiv of this closing event. We propose you to have an exchange today about lessons learned, promising practices, and common challenges for the sustainability of gender equality actions and policies. And as a very inspiring start, I would like to present Marcela Linkova, uh, who will talk about temporalities of change gender equality plans, eligibility criteria, and beyond. Thank you very much, Marcela, for accepting our invitation to give a keynote, which I am sure will inspire and motivate us as in this final event journey. 
Marcela Linkova holds a doctorate in sociology from Charles University in Prague and is a researcher at the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Science, where she leads the Center for Gender and Science. Her research focuses on sociology of gendered organizations, research careers, governance of research, and research assessment from a gender perspective. Marcela also examines the material discursive practices through which gender equality policies and initiatives are adopted and implemented at the European and Czech country levels. Between 2017 and 2021, she was the chair of the ERAC Standing Working Group on Gender in Research and Innovation. She is very active, I can tell you, she's very active in developing policy solutions for gender equality in research uh, and has been involved in several European uh, Union funded projects. Most recently, she was the coordinator of the Eurison 2020 Gender Action uh, Project. And she currently participates in Gender Smart, Casper, UNICEF, and Resistire. She has served um, as expert on advisory boards of the European Commission and in the Czech Republic, and is an alumna of the International Visitor Leadership Program, Women in STEM. Her work has appeared in European Journal of Women's Studies, Gender and Research, and Science and Public Policy, among others. Marcela, thank you very much again for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Maria, for this really kind uh, invitation and introduction. And I really want to thank Supera for inviting me uh, to be here today with you and share some of my thoughts. It's, in fact, my first trip abroad, my first work-related trip abroad since March 2020. So I think it's pretty clear it will hold a very special place in my heart. Uh, I really want to congratulate Supera on the work achieved because from what I'm hearing from the colleagues, you have things to be proud of. So I'm really looking forward to the exchanges this, this afternoon. Um, and uh, yeah, learn from what you have uh, achieved together. We are meeting today in unprecedented times uh, when a war is raging in Ukraine and Putin's regime is killing civilians, displacing millions. The invasion has special resonance yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the invasion has special resonance in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And it is perhaps the first time since our accession to the EU in 2004 that I see our politicians playing an active role, taking the lead and strong stances. It is a time when we see the power of EU solidarity and support, and also the time when European values and the need to protect them have come to the fore as critical aspects of what binds us together. Gender equality and diversity are clearly one of those values, but also those that member states have clashed across uh, about. And it would be foolish to think that these differences will disappear just because we can now align ourselves in our fight against autocratic Putin. Nevertheless, we are at a special time for gender equality and it has taken us a very long time to be where we are today. Several member states and the commission have now a requirement for higher education institutions and research organizations to have gender equality plans in place. This has put to practice what gender equality scholars, practitioners and activists have been calling for for a very long time to make the money talk. So we are now seeing the first results of what this may mean, but also the continued challenges and risks of this. And this is what I want to address with you today, the different temporalities of change, their implications for the opportunities, challenges, and needs that we have ahead for advancing institutional changes. Can I make this work? Yes, okay. So I will state the obvious. Intersectional gender equality is a core European value. 
This needs to be repeated because it is not a lived value and yet the gender fatigue tends to seep in. And we often see a tendency among people in power, often men, to invoke diversity as a form of policy of inactivity that will exempt them from focusing on gender inequalities. This is compounded by the additional challenge of making intersections with other axes of inequality to matter. We all know that we have to move beyond gender equality alone. We also know that we have to move beyond the additive model of inequality grounds, that intersectionality is important as it helps to reveal the multi-layered nature of oppression, and that our work in higher education and research must do better to start developing actions to achieve substantive equality. The challenge is, of course, how to do this concretely, how to do this first, so that gender equality issues are not derailed, as it is often the case when diversity steps in. Second, how to do this in contexts when just mentioning gender equality is difficult and the attacks on gender ideology and genderism reign high. And lastly, how to do this in recognition of the differences that exist across our countries, including economic differences and effects of the capitalist transition after 1989. The first point is re related to the neoliberal capitalist co-optation of diversity. When divested of considerations of power, diversity can become a toothless exercise of parading token marginalized identities to placate the demands for equality. This is of course highly relevant should the JEP requirement be extended to the private sector, but not only. The second point is related to the need of protecting academic freedoms and challenging illiberal, illiberal epistemic regimes. Part of our work at hand is in making use of the recommended area of gender in the content of research, innovation and teaching for showcasing the benefits of gender and feminist scholarship. The third is related to the centers and peripheries to borrow from Marina Blagojevic Houston. We need to admit that some of the problems that arise for monitoring gender equality in research and innovation, which I will address in a little bit, stem from this last point. We have major economic disparities across our countries that play out in our research systems. And these have bearings on careers, mobility and attrition from research but it also has a bearing on feminist and gender scholarship and also on our collective efforts in EU projects. And yet we rarely address this in our gender equality practice. Just one simple look at the person month rates in our projects is a testimony to this. What effect may this have on how we collaborate? And what does solidarity mean in this context? What does success and how to measure institutional success mean in these circumstances. So this may not be how the commission has conceptualized the triad of inclusiveness defined as intersectorial, intersectional and geographic inclusiveness, but this is how I would propose to approach, approach this concern with the issue of power at the center. For the past two years, we have lived in a time of near permanent crisis wondering about the new normal we are transitioning to. Multiple studies are underway on the impact of COVID-19 on the various forms of social inequalities, including resistire, and the impact is huge, and we know it is gendered. And just when we started getting our hopes up, Putin's armed forces invaded Ukraine and triggered a humanitarian crisis with millions of refugees who are predominantly women and children seeking shelter in the EU. Both these crises are an important opportunity to understand how solidarity and support coalesce into strong action, but how also they may dissipate. It is my hope that we will soon have gender-informed scholarship coming to elucidate uh, the dynamics of these processes. And it is clear that in terms of the research profession, these two crises will need to continue to be at the forefront of national as well as institutional policy 
development. In fact, it might be worth considering whether the JEP requirement should not explicitly be required to include the impact of COVID-19 in the design of the actions as institutional procedures for research assessments, for example, need to integrate the consequences of homeschooling and lockdowns on research performance. It is also clear that the mental and emotional strain right now is huge. This is compounding these huge stress levels that researchers, particularly in the early career stages, experience. Mental health then is another issue that we must integrate better in the HR and JEP activities. But it is of course intimately linked with the neoliberal remake of academia and the churn of postdocs. And in some countries like the Czech Republic, we continue to see take it or leave it approach to young researchers. If you don't like it, well, you can, you can go. Clearly these factors make gender equality work at times like these even more difficult. It is therefore important to keep in mind that non-action and non-responsiveness non may not have its source in the fact that people are opposed to gender equality, but because they just don't have the energy. This, is, this will probably ring true for many of you change agents and gender equality officers developing and implementing gender equality plans over the past two years. People are tired but not necessarily tired of gender equality. And yet we find ourselves at an incredibly opportune time for gender equality. In fact, I cannot recall a time when I was feeling this hopeful since the time I started working on the issue in 2001. The policy documents are strong on the commission as well as council side. We are seeing significant developments at the national level of several member states. The political support appears to be there too and strong judging by the fact that the Ljubljana declaration presented last year by the Slovenian presidency was endorsed by 37 parties, including 25 member states with the exception of Hungary and Latvia. I would really recommend reading the Ljubljana Declaration because I think it, it is an important statement of where we can move forward in the European research area. Of course, another test of this will be uh, the support for the new ERA Action 5 point, and we will see about that. This is being currently addressed in the ERA Forum uh, and should define the way forward. But as we heard from my fourth speaker, uh, this, this will be probably promising. For Horizon Europe, Commission has introduced a new eligibility criterion, which is seen by many of us as a potential game changer. And indeed, we are seeing a surge of activity at the institutional level to ensure ability to participate in competition for Horizon Europe projects. This has come at a time when we all capitalize on the fantastic results from the EU funded sister projects. We have new tools such as the DEEM tool uh, for gender equality and audit developed by ACT. We have a host of trainings made available by the GE Academy together with the perfect C quality standards for capacity building and training, which are a huge achievement. The ACT project too has inaugurated a number of communities of practice. And I have to mention specifically the amazing job done by our Polish colleagues at Jagiellonian University running the Jane C community of practice. And for example, also the 4Gen community of research funding organizations managed by Science Foundation Ireland. All these projects are generating new knowledge about change processes, the negotiations necessary, and the factors that can derail the process such as when the leadership changes. And I'm also extremely happy to report that we are in final stages of negotiating a new Horizon Europe project, Gender Action Plus, which will follow up on the Gender Action Project. But this time we're not building only a policy network to coordinate, exchange, and learn from each other, but also a community of practice for research funding organizations, which will be run by Venova. I am committed to continue to push both at the EU and national levels as we did in the past four years. And of course, there are new topics on the policy and institutional agendas for those of us who have been working on these issues 
uh, that are incredibly old. And specifically, I am referring here to intersectionality, which I have already mentioned, and also gender-based violence in academic settings. But this optimism of mine is kept in check by several issues. In our work, we often argue that power rests in diversity, that the more diverse teams are, the more creative they are, the more robust the research results. And at the policy level, we hear this too, that the differences among European countries are a strength. But of course, these differences also point to risks, especially when political leadership and vision are weak. There was another time in history when my hopes were high before. It was the sixth framework program, which introduced the gender dimension and gender action plans for the two main types of actions, the integrated projects and networks of excellence. And this is what the 2009-2009 thin synthesis report on monitoring progress or gender equality in FP6 had to say. There was a general lack of understanding as to what was meant by integrating gender into the content of the research, which was often interpreted as participation only. The complementary nature of scientific excellence and the integration of the gender dimension in research were not always appreciated. The quality of the gender action plans was frequently low. Projects often assigned little value to gender action plans. They tended to be regarded as a bureaucratic requirement rather than something of importance for the project. This perception was heightened by the fact that gender action plans were not scored during evaluation. Budget lines were rarely assigned to gender action plans. There was insufficient knowledge on practical actions to integrate gender in proposals, while support to projects on completing the gender action plans was also weak. And finally, abandoning gender action plans would be seen as sending a negative message on the importance given to gender issues in the framework programs. And you know what happened, right? Gender action plans and the gender dimension in FP7 were simplified. And the reason? Because the external experts and member states did not feel comfortable. This is what the then commissioner, Janusz Potocznik, said at the 2009 Austrian Presidency Conference titled Researching Women in Science and Technology in Vienna. In preparation for today, I reread the memo that I wrote after that conference, and it is really incredible to recall the near feminist rhetoric Potocznik used in his official speech and the linguistic equil equilibristics in the Q&A when he was asked why the commission was discontinu discontinuing the requirement of gender dimension at the project proposal stage. The member states and stakeholders did not feel comfortable. The thing is, they will feel uncomfortable again, this time, because they have more on their plate. The gender dimension is a default criterion in Horizon Europe. And then there is the recommended thematic area of gender-based violence. And we are all very careful about that one, right? So we have to learn from this and prepare because this is bound to come. We don't want this history to repeat. So it is clear that there are institutions that are taking the JEP requirement as an opportunity to start new processes, but it's also equally clear that there are also those that are considering how to sidestep, window dress, and generally comply without complying. There is a clear risk of policy churn, uh, of policy being revised for Horizon Europe without establishing a clear link between the reasons for the failure of the existing policy and how this will be overcome by the new policy. And so we can't underestimate this. And this is why the commission's ownership now is so important of why the planned gender equality plan checks are so crucial. So what do I see as necessary for the commission to do in relation to the checks? Firstly, the information on these checks must be published immediately so that the institutions know that it is real. We need the details. 
significant numbers of these checks must be performed to make them a matter. The checks must be robust and must be done by gender equality institutional change experts. They must be done by people who know what a gender equality plan should look like, what an impact pathway to gender equality is, what the impact drivers for successful implementation are, and people who won't be willing to play the game of window dressing. So thanks to the EU funded sister projects, the commission has contributed to building a community of change agents and change experts and should harness this expertise. And lastly, these checks must be made to matter. They must contain clear information about sanctions in case of non-compliance. So I will now move to addressing some of the other risks, including the ones that are related to the differences in the EU countries. One risk we have is embodied in this map. It is a map from the analysis we did in the Standing Working Group on Gender in Research and Innovation on the existence of the JEP requirement in Europe. And you can see that the older member states tend to have a JEP requirement, whereas the newer ones don't. And this creates particular opportunities, but also risks and this will need to be tackled in the monitoring and evaluation and further evolution of the JEP requirement. The other risk is related to the headline indicator for gender equality used up until now, the proportion of women in grade A or full professors. As my colleague in gender action, Dr. Angela Wroblewski shows in her analysis, of the ways countries implemented their era national action plans, the countries that have more comprehensive policies are among strong innovators or are, are innovation leaders, have higher proportions of institutions with a gender equality plan and have higher proportions on women of women on boards, are countries that score the worst in terms of the headline indicator. And in contrast, the countries that do not have policies or those that have policies that Angela calls actionistic, that score the lowest on the innovation scoreboard have comparatively very few institutions with a JEP and have marginal representation of women on boards are those that score comparatively the highest in terms of grade A. So we have to be very careful about the indicators we use and how and with this, I will now address some issues facing us in terms of institutional change and the unintended consequences in complex systems. So the effect of the JEP requirement, uh, the effects of the JEP requirement are not clear cut. Of course, it's a huge window of opportunity, especially in countries that do not have a national policy to fall back upon. It can be used as a leverage to initiate activities, and we are seeing this firsthand in our center in the Czech Republic. The energy, motivation, and support this has generated for people who have up to now worked in a complete vacuum is really great to see. On the other hand, the threat of window dressing is equally huge. Uh, there will, of course, be instances of institutions that will try to get it over with and for forget about it. For the institutions that are already working on gender equality and are perhaps implementing projects uh, to implement institutional changes, the challenges are different. And this is particularly true when institutional structures, rules, and remits are layered. In some countries, new national requirements have been adopted in recent years, such as Spain, and the national JEP requirements do not always overlap with the JEP developed in the projects in line with the ERA objectives. And this can create tensions and due to the extreme, extreme time constraints puts the responsible change agents in difficult positions because they have to negotiate whether to focus on the legal requirements or the project needs. A related concern is that of competing institutional structures. In some projects, we have seen negotiations, if not always tug of war, over responsibility and control of the agenda. This is tightly coupled with the issues of institutional visibility, prestige, and reputational issues. 
Related to this is the fact that the new st stakeholders ushered in to the process by the national legislations may have new powers and are using these powers to le leverage to achieve their particular goals. So when boundaries and responsibilities are not clearly drawn, this can add to the difficulty of promoting institutional change and in food dragging. And here I want to refer to the science and technology studies concept of the trading zone, which Lutmergert and myself used in a paper last year to analyze these very negotiations. The last challenge I want to mention is one that is in a, uh, the effect of projectification, which is part and parcel of the neoliberal makeover of our societies. And of course, it does not affect only gender equality agenda or higher education and research. We have a body of research now demonstrating the deleterious effects of projectification in terms of the loss of human resources, capacities, and institutional tested knowledges. The temporality of project life is much different from the line system, and indeed this is an issue for the sister projects too. The end of a project often means the end of employment contracts, and this in turn creates agenda handover issues. When not managed properly by the institutional management, the losses are grave not only for the individuals, but also for the institutions. So the nonlinearity is a prime feature of gender equality efforts. Political support wanes and vexes at the EU level and country level, and there are misalignments in these times. This is, of course, not a technical issue only, but also deeply effective. As I was reminded two weeks ago on a panel with Professor Pat O'Connor at the final conference of the CASPER project. Casper developed four feasibility scenarios for a potential gender equality certification or award uh, in Europe. And we were discussing the potential opportunities afforded by such a prospective scene. Ireland, where Pat is, is for many of us a beacon of gender equality efforts. In fact, they have just launched a second review by their higher education authority of gender equality. And yet, being on the inside where Pat is, the resistances, the window dressing, the food dragging are more than real. To someone like me, where it is only in the last five years when things started moving a bit at the national policy level in the Czech Republic, and now with the EU JEP requirement, uh, we have a new uh, driving force, the situation looks very different. And my emotions are very different from Pat's, including in relation to the potential certification scheme. So as the Casper certification made clear, these differences are really stark. Where we stand, what we need, where we see promise, and what we are expecting differs in the various corners of Europe, East, South, North, and West. The same nonlinearity is manifested at the institutional level, where the temporalities are made more complex, not just the policy requirements, but also the temporalities of governance and changes in leadership, as well as the temporalities of institutional development and funding cycles. My colleague Anna Mitnerova on the Trigger project in Prague came up with the notion of a mistletoe strategy for gender equality actions latching on to other institutional developments like a mistletoe. It was perhaps a very fitting metaphor for how gender equality actions were made to survive at that particular institution. Britannica refers to mistletoe as a slow growing, persistent pest the natural death of which is determined by the death of the host. To many, gender equality actions are still a persis persistent pest they have to live with, but this is what must change. For gender equality actions to be sustainable, they can be regarded as a pest to be rooted out. Last fall, when I spoke at the Gender in Higher Education and Research Conference, and we were supposed to be meeting in Madrid, I invoked the importance of effect 
and the need to address effective issues. And today I want to return to this from a different angle. Standing firm and unafraid today takes on a new meaning. And this is what we need to do together. In the past four years, I was extremely privileged to chair the Standing Working Group on Gender in Research and Innovation, a network of civil servants representing the member states and associated countries. And I also had the privilege of working with some of you on the various projects and with the commission uh, as the sister projects were consulted on the JEP requirement development. And this leads me to say that we in Europe now have incredible communities for solidarity, support, exchange, research, mutual learning, coordination, networking, and mobilization. What I have learned over the years is how important these networks and communities are for sustenance, emotional and intellectual. So to close, I will address some of these benefits that I see in having these communities. Firstly, having a policy community allowed us to make concrete changes in the policy documents adopted to mobilize presidencies of the council and to create opportunities. One outcome of this is, for example, the Ljubljana Declaration presented by the Slovenian presidency. And I can't overstate this, but if to some of you, policy seems to be really, really distant, really far away, it is also one where I have seen amazing mobilizations of the responsible civil servants. What is needed for such a policy forum to work is dedication and commitment, knowledge of the system, its processes, and procedures, and I can tell you these are not easily available. The willingness to speak up, be difficult, and also sometimes make mistakes and learn from them. Secondly, because of the non-linearity, because of the waning support, the communities provide sustenance and support in times of difficulty. And then when the difficult times change, the opportunity is there for the colleagues to bounce back and join the activities. And it is also important to rec recognize that even if top political representations hold a contrarian position and are anti-gender, it is not that the civil servants hold the same position. We have a responsibility for creating opportunities for these encounters to counter the extremities of academic and policy and freedom. It must be a form of our support and solidarity to find ways how to involve colleagues, even when they can't act. Thirdly, cooperation, support, and mobilization of policymakers, scholars, and gender practitioners at the national level are crucial too. And we have seen the fruits of this in my own country, but also elsewhere. I would encourage all of you to engage. And once we know whether there is going to be a new gender group under the ERA forum, reach out. And I'm sure that on their side, the policymakers will be reaching out to the communities in their national environments as well. We need this mutual support between the policymakers, the practitioners, the scholars. I have already mentioned that our new project, Gender Action Plus, will be hopefully launched 1st June. Thematically, we will be addressing intersectionality and inclusiveness, gender-based violence, the gender dimension in research, teaching, and innovation, gender equality monitoring and in indicators in the new European research area, and finally, the implementation of JEPs and ways how to evaluate their impact at institutional level. It is my sincere hope that we will st stand firm and unafraid and that our thr through our actions, we will keep gender equality on the agenda and advance it. And that with you and others working on the institutional level, we will create policies and tools to monitor and evaluate those policies that will facilitate your work at the institutional level. I really want to thank you again uh, for this invitation. And I will close by saying that the struggle for a better, more equitable future is in the nature of social reality. It is a continuous endeavor. There was a time when, when I was asked what I wanted to achieve with the work of the Center for Gender and Science, my answer was to make it unnecessary. So that was the younger, naive me, right? Uh, 
So now the struggle is happening now and it will continue to happen now, always. And this should not dissuade me or you. It can be hard, it can be emotionally draining at times, but it can be also emotionally sustaining and so worth it when you see a small thing change and then a big one. So let's continue cautiously optimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marcela, for such an inspiring, uh, yeah, on all the things that you have already put into the table, that's great. Um, now we have uh, some time for um, questions, comments. So um, Paula is there with the, with the micro. You, you can do the, your questions both in English and Spanish, if you want. I need my oh, headphones. Yes. If, yeah, yeah I, I will get it. <laughs> Maybe you can introduce yourself when you talk. Thank you, Manuela. Yeah, Emanuela Lombardo from Madrid Complutense University. Thank you so much for your talk, uh, Marcela. Um, I would like to touch upon one, one aspect, which is um, how can we actually enforce compliance uh, of this institutional gender change um, when we know that there are challenges, there are resistances to gender equality policy implementation, and that normally it is quite difficult to introduce this mechanism for monitoring and uh, enforcing compliance uh, in university and re research and uh, funding organization. Thank you. Uh, yes, if we do not have uh, some other, yes, yes, okay, sure. So thank you, thank you very much for the question. Uh, and yeah, it goes to those uh, crux of it, right? The main issue. Um, so I, there are several aspects to this. I think that uh, of course, always being on the watch out for the windows of opportunity at the, at the institutional level, that's clear. But I think that we really uh, need to stress the issue of um, uh, working together, involving the people and being participatory. And of course, I would say that this is the main challenge, persuading the people to engage in participatory techniques, because very often we don't have time. Uh, people in academia are not always used to this. Uh, uh, top management is not often used to deliberative procedures. They just make decisions. So the challenge is to get them to the table for the participatory participatory approaches. But once that happens, I think that uh, doors open because it's really, I think, not always that people are really against gender equality, but they, they don't have information. They don't know what the thing uh, is about. Uh, they may be persuaded, persuaded by examples uh, and things can be made to matter. Uh, internationalization and you know other things that are important for the institution. So from my perspective, I, I think that what we're seeing is where the participatory approach uh, is successful, then the chances of getting things done are you know so much so much bigger. And so I would really advocate for this. And I think that uh, GE Academy has done fantastic work and Yellow Window developing you know these uh, uh, these techniques. And I think that this is something that we really need to learn and incorporate as much as possible to, to the work that we're doing. Because, I mean, and I can admit this, you know, there was a time when I thought that I would righteously march in, say, this is the right thing to do, you know, like, how can you not understand gender equality and then be really surprised that they are not listening. So I, I really think that there, there is a way to be humble, to listen to the concerns, of the multiple parties at the 
institutional level because people have different stakes than I have with gender equality. And then we need to see how to make those align. But so for me, the participatory approaches that are being developed in the sister projects, that's, that's really important. Tenemos uh, también uh, preguntas uh, online uh, de, la, de la parte web, webinar de la conferencia. Uh, I will ask in English, don't worry. <laughs> don't have to put your headphones just to introduce. Uh, so the two questions we, uh, we have, one is uh, a bit in line with uh, Emanuela's one uh, about um, what can be done further. You, you, you asked about, uh, uh, about enforcement of those gender equality plan and someone uh, through the webinar uh, function uh, asked about what can be done more on the top of what has been done uh, already to further improve the quality of the gender equality plans adopt uh, under the remaining years of Horizon Europe, but also under the next framework program. And another question in mo is more specific. I think it was about uh, the contribution of one of your Czech uh, uh, colleagues, I think. Uh, you, you talk about mistletoe, right? About parasitic uh, thing, yeah. And uh, um, someone would like to, to have the name of your colleague again so that uh, she can okay. find okay. more about it. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the name of my colleague is Anna Mitnerova uh, and she's from the, well, I think it can be easily found when I mentioned Trigger. So she's from the uh, yeah. uh, Technical University in Prague. Uh, and uh, so the first one, what we can do more, um, you know, what I would say is that we should now concentrate on analyzing what is happening with the instrument that we have now. I, I would not immediately go to changing it. I mean, I think that what the commission has proposed and what is being developed in many countries, uh, you know, is a really solid ground. It's, it's, not that we need to add so much more. The issue is really what, what actions get there and how it is implemented. And so where I really see like really serious need is to start working on ways to analyze the impact at the institutional level. The, the policymakers will want this. I know, for example, in Ireland, this is now a, a concern. You know, they, they want to know if what they have imposed on their higher education works and what impact it will bring. You know, will there be more women among professors? Will women contribute more to the decision making and governance processes? So these are really, you know, will knowledge be better? Will, will we integrate gender better? So th this is this is really, I think, the most important thing. I mean, at the institutional level, I think it would be great if we continued to do research using the various, you know, uh, theoretical approaches that we have, STS or feminist institutionalism, whatever, uh, to analyze what happens when when you embark on on this on this route. Uh, but then the other bit will be to, to see the impact and uh, develop uh, ways to measure the impact. And I mean, in Casper, uh, Marina Kakache, Lut Mergert, and myself were looking into the impact drivers and how those could be operationalized. So this is one way, but there are other ways. And so I, I think that this is the more important thing that we have to support the policymakers with developing robust uh, methods to, to measure the impact. Okay. Hay más preguntas. Bueno, um, so I'm going to 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 do a question myself. Oh, okay. This. Okay. Okay. Yes. Sure. <laughs> no, it's not working. Okay, um, because of, of this issue of the monitoring, um, I would because I'm, I'm a bit ignorant of the last measures introduced in the by the European Union in, in the research in the last plan. And um, I was wondering if there is any requirement for the institutions 
not only to, to adopt the gender equality plans, but also to monitor the progress, uh, because that, that would, would make it much easier, of course. Well, that's the thing, it's there on paper, data collection and monitoring. It's one of the, it's one of the obligatory building blocks. So, I mean, you know, this is, this is the thing that we will also, I mean, maybe the commission can put, a, you know, we will see what is in the, in the work program for the other uh, periods uh, in Horizon Europe. But I think that it would be really great to have a comparative research study into, you know, from a national perspective and, and take several case studies at the national level and look how they have grappled with the uh, mandatory building blocks. I mean, we, we are trying to do this. My colleagues uh, at, at the center who are responsible for cooperation with the research organizations and policymakers at the national level, we are trying to see how we could start monitoring this with the institutions, whether they could report to us what they are doing, not just you know having the jabs, but also you know more detail. It, I think this would be really an important study to understand how the institutions grappled with this and uh, yeah, qualitative research into this. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's always funny because it's <laughs> the same function leads to different effects in mind, always. Uh, otras, uh, otra pregunta de, de, desde Argentina, Gloria Bonder. Um, asking um, about, uh, you, you mentioned manifestations of impact, and uh, she would like you to be more specific about it, but where are you thinking of in terms of manifestations of impact? <laughs> <laughs> if you can. So, Maxim, can you, manifestations of impact on what, sorry? Uh, well, just you, you. I think you mentioned indeed um, how how impact can unfold and can express itself. What did you, what did you mean by that? To be to be monitored. Well, because what what we often have for monitoring is uh, more on the outcomes side. You know how many things are you know trainings are done, etc. But impact is really, you know, how the change happens. So if you define at the institution level that you want to achieve such and such thing, you know, I don't know, change your research culture to be in line with certain priorities or, uh, I don't know, change the uh, proportion of women in the leadership positions, then, you know, to measure this is different than to measure how many trainings, for example, for leadership skills or gender sensitivity leadership uh, you perform. So it's, it's really, you know, more on the uh, long-term impact, achieving the institutional uh, change that you have set out at the beginning that, that are the un underlying uh, objectives of the gender equality plan. Okay, so we are almost one. Moment. There is just one last question that was dropped in the chat. I will read it in Spanish. So, Marcela, if you want to worry. <laughs> Una pregunta de Regina Asencio. Eh, ella cree que creo que estos cambios positivos en avances en igualdad de género se han dado. Y pregunta. Estos avances positivos se correlacionan con situaciones sindicales donde los profesores tienen mejores condiciones laborales o están altamente precarizados, a diferencia de países donde las dinámicas de participación no son realistas por las cargas, fragmentación de las dinámicas a las que nos vemos sometidos. Pregunta desde América Latina específicamente. Could you, could you help me with the question? I yeah. can understand yeah. them. Uh, uh, it, it was a question about if uh, the, the, um, the impact, the step, not the impact, but the, the, the quality actions are better where uh, uh, professors and researchers are not precarious. Mm -hmm. They have, they have a better, mm -hmm. she was talking also about the unionized, and so they are 
unionized, so they mm -hmm. are they are not precarious. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, the issue of precarity of the research profession, uh, that's that's great. And of I mean, I'm, I can't even say that I'm aware of a country that would not have precarious working conditions in research and high degrees of uh, certainty, job certainty. Um, to the extent that we uh, think about the change process as a uh, being developed in a participatory manner, then I think it's really important to, to speak to the different segments of the institution, including the early career researchers. And it's absolutely true. And we're seeing it you know, in my center in the Czech Republic, the mobilization and willingness for people to speak up against whatever conditions, not just, I don't know, sexual harassment, but also just mobbing or unequal pay uh, and, and just bad working conditions in general. You know, if, if you're on, I know, two year contracts and really dependent on your superiors, you won't speak up. This is something that we need to recognize. So I, I think it's really uh, a matter of persuading the management and the leaders uh, and, and people in positions of power uh, to start thinking differently about what we want from research and researchers. And this is, of course, you know, perhaps one of the toughest things. Um, in my, for my PhD, I looked at the um, changes in the governance of the Czech research system. And of course, what we have seen with the shift of, you know, what I analyzed as a shift from dynastic to dynamic research organization, uh, we see the increases on, uh, in short-termism and, and precarity. And uh, because we are generating so many PhDs, including so many women PhD students, I mean, the churn of the postdocs can go at infinitum. And we just then, you know, we use them up like batteries and spit them out and no one cares. And we are seeing this in some of the systems. Not all systems of higher education and research in Europe have proper uh, human resources management in place, career planning, et cetera, to take care of the people entering the system. And this is one of our you know, issues. And of course, this is also gendered. Can we move away from this short termism? Term termism? Can we move away from the systems of research assessment that we have today? That, I mean, this is one of the primary issues for the, you know, research higher education and uh, research area. And the discussion about the research assessment system is starting now. The commission has launched a new initiatives that has been endorsed and joined by multiple important institutions uh, in Europe. I mean, this is a longstanding issue, how, how <laughs> to move away from really idiotic systems of research assessment to something that will do justice to how actually research is done collaboratively, uh, that there's a lot of housekeeping work that is not visible, etc. So we really need to uh, insist now with this exercise uh, that is happening in the EU for the research assessment, um, how to uh, insist on bringing gender in and then how to tie this to how we think about research careers and how to change this both for men and women uh, and non-binary researchers in the early career stages, because this, this is the thing, you know, this, this is the crucial thing. We're losing a lot, not treating our early career researchers properly. Zulema eh, Altamirano, eh, una, la última pregunta. Thank you so much. It's more than a question, it's a reflection. I could not avoid, but I'm the director of the Women and Science Unit of the Ministry of Science and Innovation and also partner in Supera Projects. So first to thank Marcela for, for this uh, wonderful uh, speech and thanks to all the partners from Supera Project. I was uh, really happy to, just one of the reflections that you were sharing is the importance of connecting academia and policy making. You know, I'm part of the policy making part, and I would like to share with you where we are now. 
because I think if we are at this moment of hope, especially in Spain as a way of good practice, we have this new reform of the law of science and innovation with gender perspective. And as part of this reflection of integrating monitoring as this is included, is the gender equality plans of compulsory of, 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 as part of the public uh, state system and also annual monitoring. Now our challenge is to ensure that this monitoring is properly done, but it is the work of policy making and internal organizations, but this is already there. And it's also the protocol against sexual harassment, as you know, it's one of the key topics that we are like part of gender-based violence is also there, it's already there. On top of that, this is the law. This is one of the parts that Marcella was saying, this law enforcement. The second part is how to, this, to make this law going to practice, not to be only on the paper. And part of that, we have uh, already in Spain approved the state strategy uh, on gender equality. It was uh, approved on the 8th of March. It's, the, it's not on research, but there as part of 679 measures for the host, the, all the ministries and organizations, uh, the, our ministry, our research organizations, we have 66 measures. They are bringing the law into reality and they are doing it in a participatory way. That was something also Marcella was sharing. How important is to, to, to ask the, those that they are on, on the first line what they, you can do and to listen to them. So they were proposing themselves those measures. They were joining to measures we were providing. And the last, my last reflections is the importance of supporting and uh, changing minds. It's my way of saying it's training, capacity building is because Marcelo was saying it. Now it's like for us, it's very clear that what gender equality is and where we are. But at the same time, it's very important just to listen to others and to understand what is, how they are struggling. And here also we were talking with Maria at the same time. You know, it's how important is the structure to build networks on gender equality and to listen to them and to join forces because we do not need to invent because things are there. It's just to provide them no? and to support those that they're at policy making, we are struggling. So yes, this reflection, we think, I think that in Spain, we are at one point in this at looking ahead, despite all the struggling we have. Yes, I wanted to share this and thank you so much for this final conference. Thank you so much, Tulema, for your for your uh, words and, and 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 for explaining the situation uh, in Spain. Um, yeah, okay, I think uh, we are uh, okay. Just uh, I just tell you about the very important issue of coffee and <laughs> and the coffee break. Uh, we we will have it uh, downstairs where you uh, where you registered. Uh, so we have there uh, the coffee. We will also have the lunch uh, there. So that's the, the map you need to, uh, to know and to have in your heads. Thank you very much, uh, Marcela. It has been really great. Uh, thank you uh, for all the questions. And we keep on, uh, on, on this to see you. So thank you. <laughs>
um, it is a pleasure to open this panel with the presentation of the results of the efforts led by the Supera team at the University of Coimbra in setting up the university's gender mainstreaming monitoring structure. Oh, maybe pointing there. Really sorry. The mouse. Yeah. Okay. The mouse. The mouse. Oh, <laughs> the gender mainstreaming monitoring monitoring structure hereafter referred as to genes is a, a system devoted to regular analysis and assessment of the progress of gender mainstreaming strategies uh, in the University of Coimbra. Uh, it was designed by the Supera team to be ascribed in the um, university's strategic governance, cons considering two main objectives, secure accountability by setting up an effective monitoring structure of the gender equality plan, and ensuring the sustainable monitoring of gender equality across the organization beyond the JEP. Is therefore, it therefore covers two dimensions, regular monitoring of JEP implementation to assess the effectiveness and impact of gender equality work, and regular assessment and reporting on the status of gender equality in the institution. The genes uh, represents an effective response to the absence of gender monitoring and reporting mechanisms diagnosed in the super baseline assessment which uh, found that despite the availability of a significant range of sex disaggregated data, data were not analyzed and processed in a gender uh, sensitive manner into reports and other communication tools. And this con constituted a significant opportunity for improvement that the Supera team was keen to capitalize on. Yes, we will now explain the functioning of the gender mainstreaming monitoring structure. On the gene's first dimension, the monitoring of GIP implementation, the SUPERA team in close articulation uh, with the, U, the university's planning unit, devoted their efforts to creating a monitoring structure of the JEP that could be aligned with the already established monitoring structure of the university's strategic plan. Um, this approach guarantees that the university is able to monitor deep implement, deep implementation using resources and know-how that were already roots in the organization and reach with the gender dimension. Uh, this was achieved by inscribing a strong monitoring structure into the JEP itself. Uh, the plan includes uh, 56 actions whose implementation responsibility is clearly assigned uh, and decentralized across all organization, uh, or organizational units and divisions in the institution, as well as 54 key performance indicators and 21 clearly established targets, including impact measurements. Uh, it also ascribes clear monitoring responsibilities as all units and divisions are required to uh, twice uh, a, a year report on their implementation efforts to the central service in charge of general reporting. Uh, this creates the conditions for monitoring JEP implementation and impact whose results are uh, disseminated across the organization in a biannual, in a biannual basis featuring information on in output, outcome and impact indicators that account for the effectiveness of the implemented measures. Here we have an example of JEP monitoring. Uh, both graphs um, concern the state of implementation of JEP following the first monitoring exercise of the plan, referring to the first semester of 2021. The first graph concerns the status of implementation of each of the actions included in the JEP, and the second one presents the implementation rates by strategic objective. Those graphs were constructed by the central services in charge of coordination and general reporting, uh, the planning, management, and development division of the University of Coimbra. With the data uh, on, GIP, on JEP implementation, they received from faculties and administrative divisions, which had monitoring responsibilities. 
In terms of regular assessment and reporting on gender equality, the GIMS includes a model of indicators drafted by the SUPERA team uh, to support regular monitoring and reporting of the university's situation on gender equality. And this is achieved uh, through the introduction of gender disaggregated statistics and other uh, and um, other gender indicators in institutional reporting, which is already visible uh, in some public reporting processes, uh, management reports, for example. Uh, one additional effort in setting the genes has been the institutionalization of gender sensitive language throughout the process, uh, resulting in the use of uh, inclusive communication in materials. The GIMS is also instrumental in monitoring the university's, uh, university's efforts in pursuing the sustainable development goals, particularly, particularly uh, goal five. <clears throat> Here we have uh, visual examples taken from two key public documents where gender disaggregated data were used for the first time at the university to report on indicators other uh, than overall sex distribution of uh, students and staff. The first image refers to members of the academic community who participate in sporting activities at university by gender, and the second is, is the staff distribution by gender and, and the educational uh, qualifications. These are also examples of the use of inclusive communication, both uh, verbal and visual. In terms of success factors, we emphasize that the fact that the university was already equipped with a robust information management system that includes a wide range of uh, indicators disaggregated by sex opened the pathway for the integration, integration of gender mechanisms for gender analysis that uh, were uh, previously absent within a uh, 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 already existing solid planning and uh, reporting institutional system. <clears throat> the SUPERA team also relied in, on fruitful collaboration with the head of the administration unit in charge of the university's strategic plan um, managing management to ensure a strong uh, JEP monitoring system that uh, was both incorporated into routinized management procedures and effective in ascribing accountability in uh, implementation for implementation. Uh, the fact that the Jeep, the JEP runs at the same time as the strategic plan facilitates the integration of uh, the genes into the governance structure as the monitoring efforts are conducted simultaneously with using the same procedures and, and resources. In terms of challenges and obstacles, uh, we highlight only two of many aspects. Uh, one main major challenge concerns uh, data protection regulation, uh, which hinder the collection of data that would allow for a more sound intersectional genes. This challenge is both external, based on uh, uh, national and international laws on data protection, but also internal, uh, based on the institutional interpretation of the laws, which can be less or more restrictive. <laughs> Another important challenge that we can classify as a sustainability challenge is the lack of gender specific structures and expertise beyond SUPERA, uh, which may hinder more comprehensive and in-depth analysis and evaluation after the end of the project. The SUPERA team's uh, uh, efforts on training and capacity building and on providing guidance and instruments to support gender sensitive data collection and monitoring uh, might not be enough to address uh, this challenge. Despite the, these challenges, uh, the structural impact of the genes uh, uh, is already visible and the number of institutional processes are in place that offers guarantees of sustainability after SUPERA. Firstly, the GIMS assures that progress is in pursuing gender equality can be assessed for the first time at the university by, uh, by providing a clear gender framework. Secondly, uh, the GIMS has an overarching impact as it was designed to involve all faculties and administrative units as they all have responsibilities in the implementation and reporting 
of the JEP. And thirdly, uh, the strategy adopted for the integration of the genes uh, in the uh, university's general information management system contributes to its sustainability and uh, ownership uh, by ensuring the normalization uh, as an integral uh, part of institutional data uh, collection, monitoring, and reporting processes. It also, also, also pushes for institutionalization of gender inclusive language across the uh, organization. Uh, I will end with some uh, uh, reflections on lessons learned and suggestions. <clears throat> This practice highlights the importance of conducting a strong initial, uh, initial assessment of the state of play in the organization, not only uh, for identifying gender gaps that need to be addressed in data collection, monitoring and evaluation, but also to assess uh, the organizational structure of opportunities that and shed, line on feature, uh, shed light on features that can be capital, capitalized on uh, to build a strong uh, genes. <clears throat> this diagnosis is also an important uh, opportunity uh, to setting up relationships with key uh, actors and, and allies early in the gender equality plan process, which in our case proved uh, important in the design of uh, the gender mainstreaming monitor monitoring structure. Uh, concerning the JEP design, it is essential to define specific and measurable objectives and targets, <clears throat> along with clearly ascribed responsibilities with regard to their uh, monitoring, <clears throat> not only to effectively support ownership of the, strategic, of the strategy by the whole uh, university community, but also to ensure accountability for implementation. And finally, Anchoring monitoring instruments into existing structures and practice ensures institutionalization and strengths the sustainability of uh, gender equality efforts. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much um, for this first inspiring practice on the importance of um, monitoring the progress, and um, you even finished three minutes before, amazing. So for monitoring the progress in gender equality and to make visible what this progress is and share it with the whole uh, university community, but to anchor these into what was already there in these pre-existing practices, which is so important to then ensure the sustainability of, of the, and to use the, the opportunities that are already there. So uh, we move now to the next inspiring uh, practice of institutionalization from Central European University, Anna Belen Amil, on increasing the representation of women as faculty. And Anna Belen Amil is the gender equality officer at Central European University for the Supra project and other funded projects. Um, she has been working on designing scripts and delivering trainings for higher education and research institutions. And um, she holds an Erasmus Mundus, Mundus master degree in women and gender studies and a postgraduate degree in clinical psychology and cognitive therapy. Marta. Anna you. Belen, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I want to introduce and share with you uh, the Central European University policy on increasing the representation of women as faculty. First, what it is and what it's for. Uh, it's an affirmative action policy to increase the proportion of women in the faculty body, as you might have guessed already, for the very creative title of the policy. And it has been created to tackle the gender imbalance in professorial ranks. So in May 2021, one month before passing the policy, our numbers looked like this. At assistant professor level, 41% women. At associate professor level, 27 women percent. Full professor, 26%. So this phenomenon, of course, is not unique to CU, but it is particularly challenging for us for three reasons. First, we are mostly a social sciences and humanities oriented university. Disciplines where female graduates are in slight majority, so these numbers look even less promising. 
Second, that the below parity at the assistant professor level implies that there's not a big enough pool of women who could get eventually promoted to the upper ranks. And third, it is a longstanding problem at CU that the community was aware of and recognized as such, but systematic measures were never taken, but rather well-intended ad hoc efforts that were actually not solving the problem. Okay, so how did we do this? It was a one-year process. While I tell you the story, I, I will try to highlight mistakes, challenges, lessons learned, and strategies that led to the approval of the policy in its final form. So first of all, we had already anticipated in our gender equality plan approved in 2019 that affirmative action measures were going to be designed to tackle this problem. So this was not a surprise for the community, or at least it was not supposed to be a surprise if they had read the gender equality plan. We took inspiration. Yes, we did. We took inspiration in the Eindhoven University of Technology Curie Fellowship Program, by which vacancies for assistant, associate, and full professorships are opened exclusively for female candidates for a period of six months. And if a female candidate is not successfully recruited after six months, then this vacancy is open to all genders. And only when an department has reached a ratio of 50% women in a given rank, the department will be exempted from this policy. So as you can see, this policy in the Eindhoven University is a very strong affirmative action policy. So I rewind now to June 2020, a small working group that included the prorector of social sciences and humanities in our university put together a first draft of the policy. This draft policy was softer than the Eindhoven policy, but still had a strong affirmative action component. And our expectation was to present this policy draft to the senior leadership team which is the first step at CEU in the process of policy approval. And we were expecting to present this policy to them while the supportive prorector of social sciences and humanities was still in office. But due to institutional delays, we didn't make it on time. The supportive prorector stepped down and a new prorector took office who we found out later was not as supportive of such strong affirmative action policy. Of course, we were uh, disappointed, but what seemed to be a drawback turned out to be a wake up call. It made us realize that we had got a little bit carried away and we were relying too much on the support of only one person and we hadn't been inclusive enough in the making of the policy which would have translated at a later stage uh, in either failure to pass the policy at the Senate or failure to implement it due to strong resistances. So lesson learned, we continued. So a couple of months later, November, 2021, we created a much wider working group, working group to rewrite the draft and to develop strategy. So a total of 12 faculty members this might seem very little, but CU is very little. So 12 faculty members is 5% of the total or even a little bit more, 10% of the total. So, um, and this group included heads of departments, um, including lawyers, the previous prorector and the new prorector, um, all of them together. There were countless drafts and 11 p.m. emails and meetings until we reached consensus. The new draft looked not at all like the first one. The affirmative action component got much softer and instead other gender sensitive elements were incorporating, incorporated in the recruitment process. So let me now navigate you through a close up of the elements of the policy from right to so from left to right. Um, first component, 
the announcement of vacancies, so faculty vacancies in the university from now on contain, contains this text. CU is an equal opportunity employer and values geographical diversity and gender diversity, thus encouraging applications from women and or other underrepresented groups. Since CEU strives to increase the share of women in professorial positions, given equal qualifications, preference will be given to female applicants. And this other piece of text, CEU recognizes that personal and family circumstances shape the trajectory of one's career and working patterns. As such, and in line with CEU's promotion of equal opportunities, we encourage applicants to detail periods of leave, part-time work, or other situations in their applications so that the search committee is able to assess an applicant's academic record fairly in the context of their circumstances. Second element, second component, is that search committees must be gender balanced. Third component, we wanted to encourage search committees to take an active approach to recruitment. This is not just publishing the call and waiting for women to apply, but rather reach out to suitable female candidates through professional networks and invite them to apply. But um, yes, this hopefully would lead to a more gender balanced distribution in the pool of applicants, therefore increasing the chances of having uh, women shortlisted. So in the policy, we ask search committees to reach an applicant pool with a gender distribution that mirrors the gender distribution of the PhD graduates in the given discipline in Europe. Yes, I said it slowly because they stuff. We couldn't ask for 50-50 in pool of applicants because we know different disciplines have different uh, gender ratios in graduates, uh, the, the graduates. So we wanted to mirror the pool, of, uh, the pool of PhD graduates in Europe. This percentage would be agreed upon with heads of departments in a consulted, consultative process. So we were not going to impose, but to discuss. Fourth element, we would give support to search committees by providing gender sensitive recruitment guidelines. Fifth aspect, we ask search committees for gender balance shortlisting. Number six, the search committee must monitor the gender distribution at all stages of the recruitment process, write a report, give it to the provost and give it to me, the gender equality officer. So our way to Senate approval. In the shape that I, was, I just described, the policy passed senior leadership team revision. So we were ready to go to academic forum with strong support from the rector and the provost, both males, as you also might imagine. Uh, in the academic forum and the Senate, which are the next two steps in policy approval at CEU, some members of faculty raised objections. Some of them were predictable, such as this policy goes against equal opportunities for men. But others were not that predictable. Um, one of the objection was that it's impossible to guarantee a specific gender distribution in the applicant pool, because no matter how active the efforts are to reach out to female candidates and invite them to apply, search committees cannot prevent hundreds of men from applying to the position. And that will make, uh, this is totally out of their control. And the other objection was that some women faculty pointed out that aiming for gender balanced search committees would punish female faculty for being women, since given that they are in minority, it would force them to take part in each and every search committee, whereas this is not the case for their uh, male counterparts, which is true. So, we took note of these objections and took the mandatory elements out of both articles. We now ask for a gender balance search committee, but all possible measures will be taken to avoid overloading female faculty with committee work, including invited female professors from other departments to the search committee, regrouping administrative and other workload falling on female search committee members, and or introducing pre-screening of applicants. 
Then we rephrased a mandatory requirement and made it softer. Now search committees should aim for a pool of applicants with the same gender distribution than the PhD graduates in their discipline. So this is not a must anymore. And third, we made the gender balance shortlist requirement softer by adding as a rule. And if this gender balance is not achieved, then the search committee has to provide justification for that in their final report. So after policy approval, consultation with heads of department regarding the aimed gender distribution of the pool of applicants took place. Uh, I took statistics both from the CEU PhD graduates and from Eurostat, that looks like this. All heads of department replied promptly and uh, <clears throat> very collaborative manner, and we reached agreement very soon. And the table with these percentages um, per discipline was incorporated in the annex of the policy for everybody to see. So, challenges. At CU, we have a lack of online application portal. It makes it very difficult to monitor gender of applicants. This means that we are um, people who want to apply for a position at CU, send an email with a CV and a recommendation letter attached. It's very 90s, very 1990s style. Uh, hopefully we will buy an online application portal soon. So this is soon to be solved. Now we're undergoing a current slowdown of uh, faculty hires combined with, of course, a much softer affirmative action policy that we had dreamt of. This will make uh, progress much slower. And, oh, yes, I'm, I'm almost done. And something that disappeared from there, but I want to share with you, uh, implementation is another challenge. So how to make this policy part of the normal routine of the recruitment process, instead of me as the gender equality officer having to guess when a vacancy opens and chase the search committee members to ask for the famous report. So strengths. Strong, leader strong top leadership support at the moment of the policy approval and now as well, after a radical, radical change in CU governance, we still have great support for the policy. Supera definitely acted as a catalyst because one, partner university served us as benchmarks and two, because it introduced a strong accountability element. We are being watched and monitored. We made a commitment through our gender equality plan to increase the proportion of women professors. And now it's time to show results to the consortium and to the European Commission. Regarding supera principles, I believe this has been a, a cumulative effort because it builds on previous failed institutional efforts. Um, and on efforts of other universities from which we took inspiration. We believe that is inclusive. Um, more than a dozen people worked on the draft policy and the final version of the policy incorporated the objections from the wider community. Innovative, maybe not so much. <laughs> And I would say this is as sustainable as it gets uh, institutional policy with a Senate stamp on it. Thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us of the importance of the classical, the good old quotas which is always important to address structural uh, inequalities that are there. And it's important to have also these strong affirmative actions. And I think you had some novelties as well because the PhD reflecting, no, to mirror, it's, it's something a bit new, no? So uh, thank you very much. And we move now to the next inspiring institutional practice uh, from um, Madrid Complutense University by Marta Aparicio, the Gender Equality Nodes uh, Networks. Um, Marta Aparicio is Associate Professor in the Department of Social Psychology and she's member 
of the research group on psychology, gender, and health. These are also her main research lines. And she coordinates the Master of Gender Studies at UCM. And she teaches in the Master on LGBTQI plus studies. Um, and she is a member of the Red de, Red de Nodos de Igualdad, the, this equality gender uh, node network, uh, and has been in the core team of Supra from the beginning. Marta? Thank you, Manuela. Um, Voy a hablar en español, así que <ríe> conéctense si, si lo necesitan. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar quería dar las gracias a, a María eh, por, por incorporarnos a este, a este proyecto y sobre todo a, y a Paula y a Lorena que nos han ayudado muchísimo a toda la red de nodos en estos cuatro años. Y, y por supuesto no hablo en mi nombre, sino en toda la red. Tengo ahí una amplia representación de, de nodos que ahora, que ahora presentaré. ¿Por qué queremos presentar esta práctica como práctica inspiradora? Voy a dar los datos académicos y luego hablaré desde la emoción, ya que soy psicóloga, pues voy a utilizarlo un poco. Eh, eh, voy a ponerles en contexto. El contexto de la, en, en la Universidad Complutense es que somos, eh, somos 69.893 estudiantes, eh, un 38% de hombres y un 62% de mujeres. Eh, en el ámbito académico de investigador, pues eh, somos 6.372 personas, un 51,8% de hombres y un 48,2% de mujeres, no estamos mal. Y luego en, el, eh, en personal administrativo y de servicios, pues eh, hay 3.328 personas, aquí hay 42% de hombres y un 57% de mujeres. Eh, académicamente hay 26 facultades eh, de cinco campos de conocimiento, no tenemos grados de ingeniería, pero tenemos STEM, ciencias sociales, humanidades, etc. Eh, ¿Tenemos segregación horizontal? Tenemos segregación horizontal. Eh, en términos de estudiantes, pues eh, no, no están repartidos en todas las academias de la misma manera. Eh, pues hay menos mujeres en el ámbito de la ingeniería, perdón, de la informática, eh, en trabajadoras sociales hay más mujeres y en educación hay más mujeres. ¿no? Y luego en términos de staff, pues pasa lo mismo, se da la pirámide invertida que ya todas ustedes conocen, eh, hay un, menos de un 30% de mujeres en el ámbito de, de la informática, por ejemplo, y menos de un 40% en físicas, matemáticas y en filosofía. Eh, la aceleración vertical pues, se da en un gráfico de, de tijeras, eh, las mm, profesoras a tiempo completo pues, somos 36%, mientras que los hombres a tiempo completo son un 64% y eso se invierte en profesoras ayudantes o asociadas que son un 57% de mujeres y un 43% de hombres, así que aquí claramente ven nuestra segregación. Eh, y en las posiciones de poder, bueno, pues... Eh, eh, digamos que hemos eh, limpiado un poco la cara y en los equipos rectorales hay un, <risa> hay un balance de género equilibrado, eh, pero nunca ha habido ni, ninguna rectora ni creo candidata, si no me equivoco no quiero meter la pata. Eh, ¿Qué es la red de nodos? Pues la red de nodos es son unas, eh, una idea que, que se tuvo desde el proyecto de Supera, es hacer una, una, eh, un foco en cada facultad eh, donde eh, hubiera una persona de referencia que pudiera transmitir pues, lo que se iba haciendo a través del plan de igualdad y de la, del proyecto Supera en cada facultad. Se contactó con personas de todas las facultades y somos todas eh, miembros del, del staff académico. Eh, perdóname, pero es que lo voy traduciendo del inglés. Bueno, voy a hacer, intentar hacerlo lo mejor posible. Eh, todas eh, oh, eh, todas eh, se consultó con los decanos, pero no, no estamos eh, nombradas por, la, por las decanas o decanos de nuestras facultades, sino que eh, nos apoyan en distintos niveles, luego hablaré de eso, eh, y por la igual, eh, unidad de igualdad, eh, basado pues, en, en experiencias previas. Todas somos voluntarias, eso quiere decir que no tenemos ningún descargo de nuestras tareas académicas por realizar esta tarea. Eh, y solo participó un hombre, no porque nos invitara a otros, sino porque solo participó un hombre. Eh, el rol, pues nuestro rol ha sido variado en estos años, hemos participado en, el, en los procesos de diagnóstico de, de las desigualdades en la UCM, hemos portado, formado parte de la, de la formulación, la implementación y la evaluación de las actividades que hemos ido realizando, hemos formado parte de como un grupo facilitador para movilizar en nuestras facultades actividades y dinámicas de participación, es decir, hemos trabajado, que luego insistiré en ello, de abajo arriba, es decir, que nos dieran ideas para poderlo implementarlo hacia arriba, eh, esto es una, ha sido clave. 
Hemos intentado identificar agentes de, de cambio social en nuestras facultades para tener alianzas para todo este proceso porque hemos visto que es fundamental eh, y bueno, pues hemos intentado eh, trabajar como un grupo que, que fomentara esa inclusividad de todas las personas que querían participar. Hemos identificado, hemos hecho foros de identificación de resistencias y hemos encontrado muchas y variadas y que también están recogidas en el proyecto. También hemos encontrado necesidades y, y prácticas inspiradoras de, de mucha gente en la, en la universidad, de todos los que somos, que ya estaban haciendo muchas cosas. De hecho, no, hemos conocido a mucha gente que estaba haciendo cosas muy interesantes en torno al género y hemos participado en la eh, en formación y en promulgación de actividades en torno a las políticas de igualdad y hemos actuado o hemos intentado actuar como referentes para, trans, para ser agentes de cambio en nuestras propias facultades. Eh, somos 24, pero no, no voy a nombrarlas a todas, pero bueno, sí que quería poner por lo menos, o queríamos poner por lo menos el, el nombre. Algunas de ellas están aquí, por ejemplo, Belén Rodríguez de Física, Carmen Crespo también, eh, está Onincha, están John y Ana eh, Inma, que también se ha ido, y María José, bueno, no sé si me dejo a alguien, pero bueno, están, ah, y Marta del Moral, perdona. Eh, aquí están todas. Como veis, somos un equipo grande y, como digo, de, de casi todas las facultades, de 24, de 26 que somos. Eh, ¿Por qué pensamos que esta suya es una, una buena práctica y, y, y cómo se ha, hemos intentado trabajar? Pues porque hemos intentado que hubiera un amplio reconocimiento a través de la institución y que la red fuera conocida. Hemos hecho un gran esfuerzo porque nos conocieran en los diferentes niveles. Hemos organizado, eh, nos reímos porque, bueno, eh, hemos activado, organizado actividades de la red que han sido eh, presentadas y han, sido, ha, han tenido mucha demanda. En realidad se han apuntado muchas personas a nuestras actividades. Hemos hecho eh, talleres dentro de nuestras propias facultades. Hemos hecho talleres interfacultades de más o menos de las, de las áreas. Nos hemos dividido como en cuatro o cinco áreas de conocimiento. Y además hemos hecho actividades que hicimos hace dos meses de todo el grupo. ¿no? O sea que hemos funcionado como un hijo de la red supera, pero independiente también en algunos momentos en el sentido de promover la participación. Eh, bueno... Eh, una posible, porque la pregunta era una posible indicador de, de la sostenibilidad del grupo, ha sido que muchos de los, de los miembros han mantenido distintos niveles de participación y en muchos casos eh, cuando no han participado las nodos suficientemente, las actividades no ha sido porque no estuvieran implicadas en la red de nodos, sino por pues otras cuestiones personales, es decir, la experiencia es que todas nos hemos implicado mucho en esta actividad que, como digo, no estaba ni reconocida ni pagada y, y ha sido un trabajo eh, sostenible a lo largo del tiempo de estos cuatro o cinco años que vamos trabajando. Eh, y hemos ido incrementando los niveles de empoderamiento que hemos tenido como red. Muchas de las nedes, nodos no tenían eh, ningún conocimiento sobre género o muy poco conocimiento sobre género más que una buena disposición y en estos cuatro años ha sido espectacular el avance que hemos conseguido. Eh, hemos como decía antes, eh, me he adelantado un poco, hemos eh, realizado distintas actividades. Como digo, nos hemos capacitado nosotras, pero también hemos eh, hecho formación para otros grupos eh, de acción dentro, como decía, de nuestras propias facultades. Eh, y hemos recibido, claro, apoyo técnico y hemos recibido esa formación. Eh, Hemos presentado eh, los resultados de las necesidades que, se, que encontrábamos para que se trabajara sobre ellas en la universidad en distintos foros. Participamos también, hicimos la investigación eh, durante el COVID sobre cuál era la situación de las personas de la UCM, del profesorado, sobre todo de la UCM, en los tiempos de pandemia. Y eso, cuando se presentó, también tuvo mucho éxito y todas nos implicamos ahí en nuestras facultades. Hemos realizado actividades de diagnóstico, hemos eh, intentado eh, diagnosticar cuál es la distribución de de la docencia, de la carga docencia, de, de, docente perdón, en cada una de nuestras facultades y cómo mejorar ese sistema de adjudicación de horarios que no siempre nos permite conciliar. Eh, hemos diagnosticado las o hemos hecho una diagnosis de, de las resistencias de las políticas de igualdad, que como digo son muchas y también tenemos un informe, eh, y hemos trabajado sobre el diagnóstico del sexismo ambiental y el, y el acoso en nuestras facultades para buscar estrategias para disminuir esto. Eh, y bueno, pues hemos también da, hecho formación para intentar eh, explicar todas estas buenas prácticas que hemos ido encontrando y para sobre todo con un eh, aprendizaje participativo, como digo, desde abajo para que esto vaya eh, mejorándose. ¿no? 
Eh, las técnicas usadas para crear esto han sido, como digo, muy participativa. Eh, lo que hacían las formadoras o Paula y Lorena que nos convocaban era darnos una pregunta y nosotras eh, a partir de ahí trabajábamos, hemos utilizado todas estas técnicas y hemos diseminado también cuestionarios para, para que nos ayudaran a ver cuál era la situación. Eh, ¿Cuál ha sido el impacto? ¿Cuál, ¿Cuál han sido las cuestiones que nos han facilitado y que han sido un éxito o han, o han mejorado nuestra práctica? Pues eh, que ha habido un, un coretín un, y un, un equipo de supera maravilloso que ha estado coordinando constantemente nuestro, nuestro trabajo y que ha facilitado mucho los roles. Eh, que han, eh, hemos trabajado en la base de la motivación y del continuo aprendizaje porque no hemos tenido otra, otra motivación, nada más que querer estar aquí, eh, de forma voluntaria, eh, con una aproximación participativa basada, como digo, en la escucha activa y en, y en intercambio entre disciplinas. Ha sido muy enriquecedor hablar con las compañeras de química, de biología, yo que vengo de psicología y ellas conmigo, supongo, eh, un intercambio muy, muy interesante. ¿no? Eh, también el, el buscar personas claves que nos pudieran a, ayudar en las distintas eh, eh, propuestas que hacíamos eh, la apertura a diferentes niveles de, de experiencia, como decía, porque cada nodo tenía sus propias habilidades y con eso nos hemos ido formando unas a otras. Eh, las buenas relaciones y la comunicación que hemos tenido con los equipos de canales, eh, más en unas facultades que en otras, o sea, tampoco les voy a vender aquí, diríamos, en España la moto, es decir, no le vamos a decir que todo ha sido perfecto, pero sí que hemos encontrado bastante buena predisposición, eh, sobre todo al principio del proyecto, donde bueno, se nos abrió las puertas, se nos eh, invitó a participar en distintas actividades y ahí nos hicimos un nombre de manera que la gente después ha seguido eh, eh, contando con nosotras pasado el tiempo. ¿no? Eh, eh, se ha descentralizado en ese sentido la, la, el trabajo en, en igualdad de género y los procesos de cambio estructural, que era un poco el objetivo, es decir, que no solamente sea el plan de igualdad el que mande o, o el proyecto supera, sino que sea desde las propias facultades las que se hayan empezado a movilizar para hacer un cambio estructural en sus, en sus facultades. Eh, reconocer la práctica feminista y el apoyo mutuo como una forma de visibilidad a todos los tipos de, de conocimiento y esto, esto creo que es muy importante. Ya he hablado de la aproximación de abajo arriba y eh, bueno, pues eh, creemos que la red de nodos, no es porque seamos miembros, pero que ha sido una, una, una técnica de, de cambio que incluía a todas las facultades. Eh, en los dos minutos que me queda voy a hablar de los problemas, podría estar más tiempo. Eh, bueno, pues ha habido falta de recursos eh, o de una falta de apoyo permanente. Voy a ser sincera, hubo un cambio rectoral y ahí pues, hubo un cambio también de políticas y en ese sentido se contó menos con la red de nodos. Creo que no vieron la oportunidad que significaba esta red de nodos para trabajar en las facultades y bueno, pues en algunos momentos nos ha costado mucho llegar. Y, y aún así hemos seguido trabajando. Creo que se equivocan y que deberían usar esta red de nodos para trabajar porque estamos formadas ya, estamos trabajando, tenemos red de apoyo y creo que ahí podríamos hacer eh, mucho más. Hay que incluir eh, más a los estudiantes, es verdad que están cuatro años y es difícil eh, mantenerles integrados en los proyectos, pero nuestra experiencia es que cuando les hemos convocado a los, a los cursos están muy interesados y están deseosos de tener contacto con, con las nodos. Eh, bueno, eh, seguir haciendo desde luego eh, actividades donde se visibilice la, visibilice la, la igualdad de género, la, eh, las políticas y, y para trabajar todas juntas porque creo que eso es, es muy importante y eh, bueno, eh, creo que más o menos lo he contado rápido pero he contado todo. Eh, después habrá que hacer más cosas eh, eh, pues que, porque todavía nos quedan cosas por hacer. Pero bueno, creo que para no pasarme mucho más de tiempo eh, voy a pasar a la última, que es si hemos cumplido los, procesos, los principios del supera, pues efectivamente hemos creado un conocimiento y experiencias de todas las nodos, hemos trabajado en diferentes categorías, diferentes grupos, estudiantes, personal de administración y servicios, de distintas facultades, hemos trabajado desde los distintos cambios de la, o sea, de campos de la universidad, hemos utilizado técnicas participativas y de creación de conocimiento y, y en ese sentido pues ha sido un trabajo muy muy 
muy enriquecedor y como decía, para todas ha sido muy satisfactorio y para mí, que hablo en nombre de todas, ha sido eh, un revulsivo y para mí ha sido una de las mejores experiencias que he tenido dentro de la universidad porque por primera vez me he sentido incluida eh, y, y muchas veces escuchada. Así que bueno, pues yo les invito a todos a que lo exporten a sus, a sus centros de trabajo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Marta, for sharing with us this, uh, this innovative experience that is uh, bottom-up, is participatory. Um, it also enables to decentralize this implementation and not just keep it from, from the top. And, um, and also, as, as you were saying, it, it allows this feminist empowerment and these alliances that need to be nurtured Uh, also for the sustainability of, uh, of, of the, uh, the gender change and the sustainability of life and, and you know, a nice academic <laughs> feminist experience every day in the university. So thank you so much. And we move um, now to the presentation by Esther Cois from uh, Università di Cagliari. Um, and uh, she is PhD in sociology of gender and the family and permanent assistant professor of sociology of environment and territory at the Universidad di Cagliari. And she's now director's delegate for gender equality since uh, 2021. And she, uh, her research focuses on gender inequality in the use of public space, social inclusion in urban and rural areas and uh, she's currently involved in the SUPRA project and is also an uh, expert advisor in several other projects, among which UNICEF, which is also uh, leadered uh, by uh, UCM, by uh, Maria Bostello, and uh, in the CASPER project. So, Esther, when you want. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the University of Cagliari and the practice I'm going to tell you about is the institutionalization of the gender equality delegate position at UNICA. So this is a new role for our university. Indeed, for the first time in April 2021, last year, the University of Cagliari introduced in its organizational chart the position of delegate for gender equality as a part of its strategy towards a more inclusive university. But who is the delegate? Surprise. <laughs> She's the contact person for what concerns the promotion of gender equality and diversity and the fight against any kind of gender-based discrimination for all the communities that interact every day in the university context, the academic and research staff, the technical and administrative staff, and the students. At the moment, in the rector's governing team, this role is held by me, as you can see uh, from uh, this image. As I said, this is a new practice, uh, and this role includes two main responsibilities. The first is one is the connection and coordination of the 32 strategies, uh, strategic actions identified by our new gender equality plan in order to promote an increased balance between men and women in their career path in teaching and research contents. But uh, the practice also contains uh, functions that collect the previous commitment of our university on this topic, because the second main responsibility of the delegate is to operationally monitor and secure the implementation of the inclusive policies undertaken by UN UNICA, also by using other tools already existing, such as gender budgeting and the plan for positive action. But why is this practice an example of institutionalization in at least two directions? First of all, because it is an example of formalizing a new role and procedure in terms of its regulation through the formal introduction in the main university Uh, documents like the gender equality plan of a top position and office as a stable component of the uh, governance team expressly uh, dedicated to improval, to improving internal decision making processes from a gender sensitive uh, perspective. Moreover, this role gives visibility to the previous commitment of UNICA in this field because it corresponds in a clear way to the principle of gender mainstreaming as a cross-sectional dimension to all areas of the new strategic plan of UNICA, which is being defined uh, these days, teaching, research, third mission, and human resources. 
In fact, the institutionalization of the delegate for gender equality is one of the strategic actions of the gender equality plan. As you can see, this is the cover of our gender equality plan. The second meaning of the process of institutionalizing the practice is operational. First of all, in a stabilization perspective, this role integrates and gives continuity to the functions of the collective work carried out so far by the core team of Supera Project in Cagliari, together with our hub that during the four years of Supera Project led to the drafting and the formal approval of the gender equality plan. Moreover, the practice has a goal of synchronizing a process because it is the main link of an operational chain that connects the development of research and studies on gender and diversity issues carried on by the University Center for Gender Studies, which is in the process of being established in the coming months, with the promotion of organizational well-being in the um, university. Uh, that is the main function of the Guarantee Committee for Social Inclusion, or COUG, whose president is again the delegate for gender equality. The same person coordinates both offices. So what are the strengths of this practice? The main one is for sure its transversality, because the involvement of the delegate in research, teaching, and third mission areas testifies the strategic commitment of UNICA in favor of gender equality in an interconnected uh, way between its three main functions, research, precisely the production of scientific knowledge, education, so teaching cultural content and developing critical thinking, and third mission for the participation of the university in the public debate on citizenship, uh, social justice, human rights, and so on. And what are the uh, lessons learned? I'm sorry, I don't know what. Thanks to the institutionalization of this practice. First one, the importance of planning. So the need for medium and long-term work plans on measurable objectives linked to the promotion of gender equality. Second, the importance of involvement, the need to promote an increasing awareness of the relevance of gender issues through bottom-up participatory strategies involving the teaching administrative staffs and students, but also through a transparent sharing of all top-down governance decisions on the topic of gender equality. And third, the importance of resilience, or the ability to recognize and understand the uh, resistances against gender equality policies in order to find more effective methods to counter them, for example, service, pub labs, co-working techniques, and so on. And what are, oh, sorry. I don't know what's happened. Okay. <laughs> Why? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And what, what are the challenges this practice faces? First, promote work and research project, saving the opportunities of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, which dedicates uh, interesting resources to the issue of contrast in gender gap also in academia, and catching the opportunities uh, of the new European research funding programs to strengthen UNICA's participation in international networks, such as the Supera Consortium, oriented towards the production of common policy tools. Second, taking into account the impact of the post-pandemic and now geopolitical socioeconomic crisis, which has further worsened the gender gap also in the university and research fields, uh, skipping from the glass ceiling index to the glass door index. And third, using the expertise learned thanks to Supera Project to become a national and international benchmark in terms of promoting gender equality in academia. Unica Jep has been chosen by the National Commission on Gender Issues of the CRUI, the Italian Conference of University Rectors, um, as a, a an inspiring practice for all Italian universities in the guideline. This is the cover of the guideline for the drafting of JEPs. And um, in fact, uh, the Supera Consortium has been a great facilitator factor for the institutionalization of this practice at the University of Cagliari. From 2018, it has been a long and adventurous uh, journey. This is our first picture in Madrid four years ago, do you remember, <laughs> for the kickoff meeting. And meanwhile, the world has changed, our universities are, have changed, and we have changed. Uh, the Supera Consortium assured a constant comparison between 
our specific cultural context and the uh, sharing of positive models and of strategies to deal with risk. It has promoted the learning of techniques and strategies to be used for the implementation of the actions of the, of the JEP. And the last but not least, the uh, Supera Consortium along uh, uh, this, sorry. Okay. This one? No, no, yes, sir, the sharing. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Supera Consortium uh, along these years has shared global challenges, even a pandemic, uh, and local change changes like government and governance changes uh, in uh, some of our universities. And of course, the Horizon 2020 program, like Supera, has been uh, a facilitator factor for many reasons. Uh, it's a positive action since gender equality plan uh, is uh, uh, um, an eligibility criterion for uh, research funding in the European framework since the last year. And uh, um, for other reasons, like uh, the uh, scaling, uh, the its scaling perspective, because promotes the opening of borders beyond the perimeter of single universities from the national level to the uh, increasingly heterogeneous and productive European partnership. And third, it has had a multiplier effect as a frame because the reputational capital acquired in a network like the Supera uh, partnership constitutes a node to enter other partnerships like uh, this one, for example. And uh, uh, finally, how this practice corresponds to the four principles of Supera. One, cumulativeness, involves a diachronic vision, the strong impulse given by the previous rector, Maria del Zonco, for the creation of the first gender equality plan uh, at Unica, and taken up and strengthened by the current rector, Francesco Mola, for its implementation, have constituted a growing endorsement for the introduction of the Office of the Delegate for Gender Equality and its recognizability inside and outside the university. Moreover, this practice as a function of organizational integration, thanks to the coincidence of this new office with the already existing, for example, presidency of the CUG, and uh, it's the center of a supply chain coordinated by this uh, office between the structure for the production and analysis of gender studies, the center, and the structure for the production and processing of statistical data that can be used to feed uh, this, uh, this center. So the beginning of a process from, for setting up the University Center for Research on Gender Issues is a long-term goal that will be coordinated by the Office of Gender Equality and which our rector is very keen as a strategic direction for the next five years of his office. A second principle, inclusiveness, the coordination and monitoring of the, all the strategic actions of the JEP make the, this office, the Office of the Delegate for Gender Equality, a reference along these four uh, key area, areas. And uh, uh, this full coverage uh, gives the delegate a connective orientation aimed at gathering needs and suggestions from all the communities that interact in UNICA, teachers, researchers, uh, technical administrative staff and students in a participatory and uh, inclusive and intersectional way to promote diversity in all its uh, expression. Third principle, innovation, the JEP, together with the new plan for positive actions, both coordinated by the Delegate for Gender Equality and the new strategic plan, uh, where the gender equality is for the very first time a transversal area, design a challenging path of medium and long-term institutional change, and uh, aimed at achieving an organizational culture more and more equal and, uh, and inclusive. And the last principle, uh, the fourth and last, the sustainability. The sustainability of this office is assured by the integration of the JEP actions coordinated by the delegate in the uh, UNICA strategic plan currently under definition, but the sustainability is also assured by the full involvement of the delegate for gender equality in the application currently ongoing by the University of Cagliari for the human resources strategies for researchers certification at the European level. And last but not least, the creation of a specific section of a university official website focused on gender equality issues and activities in coordination between the delegate for gender equality and the pro-rector for communication. And this is the interface between UNICA, its communities, and the rest of the world to account and trace a process that had just begun and that intends to affirm and strengthen itself more and more in the future. So thanks 
Supra for everything and thanks uh, you for your attention. Thank you so much, Esther, for also reminding us of the importance of institutionalization for making a gender, gender equality policy changes. And uh, congratulations for pioneering this, this position, which also reminds us of, of the importance of where the gender unit is located. And the fact that it was located in the, in the rectorate is, is really important for doing this gender mainstreaming work that you have uh, told us um, here. So uh, we now move uh, to the last inspiring practice uh, now by the University of Deusto, um, Maria Pando and Maria Pilar Lo Rodriguez um, will tell us more about it. Maria Pando Cantelli is associate professor in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Deusto. She has been a postdoctoral Fulbright fellow at Stanford University, and she has published on literature and gender in the early modern period and women and the media. Uh, currently, she is participating in a research project uh, funded by the, the uh, Spanish Research Agency uh, on the anti-feminist resistance in the media. We want to hear more about that. Um, and she, she is also actively participating in the um, uh, Horizon 2020 project gearing roles, um, and she also held several uh, administrative positions as vice dean um, and so on. And um, Maria Pilar Rodriguez is associate professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Deusto, and she's director of the PhD program in Leisure, Culture, and Communication for Human Development. She holds a PhD from Harvard University, and she has been teaching in several US universities at Columbia and uh, has published extensively on communication, film, culture, gender studies. So you have the floor. OK. OK. Thank you very much. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes, okay. Well, thank you very much, Manuela. And uh, first of all, I want to, we want to thank you, to thank Supera Project for uh, inviting us here. It's a pleasure for us, okay? And it's a privilege to be sharing this round table with you all. I think that we are the invited project somehow <laughs> because you all belong to Supera somehow. Um, and we also want to congratulate you on this final conference. Uh, as you know, we are also the part of the core group of the Gearing Roles. It's another Horizon 2020 project. And we know and we can imagine how challenging it was just to come to this end. As Maria mentioned before, it's a winding journey some, somehow, okay? so. Congratulations on this final stage. Well, we're going to, uh, we don't want to speak for a long time. We have a lot of things to say if you want later on, but we know we are the last ones in a round table. So we want to uh, present and introduce you to uh, this handbook for the integration of the gender perspective in teaching and research. Uh, this, is a, this is part of the work package, six, out of the Gearing Roles project. Can we move like this? Yes, okay. And was one of the deliverables of the Gearing Role is still uh, in print. I mean, it's, it's forthcoming maybe within a couple of weeks, <laughs> all right? It's been published in Spanish and in Basque, not in English yet. And uh, what we wanted to do with this was basically a very, very practical handbook and practical for our faculty, for our academics, something that we could use at the university. Um, we know that there are many guidelines and they were a real inspiration for us. Particularly, there are quite a lot of guidelines on research, not so many on teaching. And we are really grateful to all this wonderful material that we had on which we relied so much. What is, what is this, what is interesting and particular about this guideline? 
basically that we try to create this guideline uh, bringing together three different aspects. Uh, that is research, teaching and learning. And together with that, we added a glossary because we, we, were, we were conceiving this guideline for people who were not experts in gender and who may want to have some kind of assistance on that. Uh, the purpose was basically to make it very, very useful. So we included a lot of examples and explanations and illustrations from real teaching and real research that we were conducting at the university. All right, so that is, that is something that is maybe really relevant uh, in our guide. Um, well, this is the description of who and when. How we began with this as, well, many of you, we, we realized the importance of keeping a balance uh, with just, just from, from top to bottom and bottom up. So what we did is just a pilot project with some uh, teachers, academics, on a voluntary basis. That is important. So we launched a call, the university, all of the different schools and faculties. And uh, so there were people, both men and women, who wanted to join uh, for us. Here you have these pie charts where you can see more or less the distribution. We have six different schools. Well, you know that we are a Jesuit university. So we have School of Theology that was also joining. Uh, and we have a group, we organize a group for teaching and a group for research. Pilar was in charge of the research group and I was in charge of the teaching group, okay? So we were organizing some of the people were sharing were in, in both groups and some of them uh, weren't. But there was more or less balance of all the, there was a representation of all the faculties and that was very good. Although you can see there also that social sciences it usually bears just a heavier balance. Let me show you very, very briefly, which I think what I think is the most interesting aspect this is the process. Well, uh, the first thing that we did with this pilot project was to ask for training. We needed some basic training for the people who were going to work on the guidelines. Uh, this training, okay, so we have there the training in research and the training in uh, teaching. The training in research uh, was conducted by Yellow Windows. Here we have Lute, we have Maxime <laughs> there. Okay, so they were giving us some basic training on the basics of all this. Uh, the same for teaching. We had also some training with from uh, some colleagues from uh, La Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya, who were already working hard on this, on real guidelines on, on teaching. So once we had this training, uh, we organized these two working groups. Uh, we have, we organized, we began in, in, in January last year, in January 21, and uh, from January to May, to May, we organized five different sessions. The sessions were running for three hours, more or less. We have organized very well each session in such a way that we have some assignments, okay, or homework from session to session. Uh, there were separate sessions for research and, and, and teaching, and then we came together at the end. Uh, what was interesting in our view is that uh, we have the feeling that all of, all of us were beginning from scratch. So there were people there who were volunteering, but there were not uh, any kind of prior um, basis or uh, knowledge on gender mainstreaming, other than the one that we had acquired through this previous training. And that was really interesting because we had the feeling and the, the, it was very participative and all of us had the feeling that we were doing something together, okay? And we were composing something there. Uh, obviously we have these sessions, we have, we, then what we decided, we had a plan, okay? A work plan and designing some indicators that could be useful for us. It goes without saying that we have a very, we have a lot of resources for that. So we were working also as part of War Package 6 with Oxford Brooks, 
okay, university who were already working very much on teaching and, the, and gender mainstreaming in teaching. So we were relying on some of the, of the indicators that they were already devising. But something that we did is that we have a we have specific system in, in DOSTO that is the uh, teaching learning or teaching learning uh, model for DOSTO. That is how that that all our uh, teaching guides or learning guides have to be uh, adapted to this model. So what we did in order to make it real, really uh, practical and useful was to adapt this gender mainstreaming in teaching to these learning guides in such a way that when we finish the pilot project, all the participants could integrate these already in their teaching and in their own learning guides that had to be published, okay? And were public for the university. So that was more or less the model. And we were following, we were adapting the indicators that we were uh, gathering from here and there into this very specific model for our university. Um, we, something else that we did that was really interesting is that for every single indicator, we have to produce some examples, some real examples in many different disciplines. So we have uh, examples in law or engineering or in psychology, education, or in uh, modern languages. All right, so that was really, really important. And that those uh, examples were also included in the guide in such a way that when you were checking the guide, you could see, okay, what can I do with this indicator? And then you have several options there, okay? Uh, so there's practical examples. And then we have final discussions in order to come, well, at first we came up with something like 35, 40 indicators, that was crazy. So we have two, we have two short listing them to 15 that we, we had uh, at the end, okay? We have the final discussion, uh, with this draft of the guidelines. And then we have a, a contrasted group outside the pilot project, okay? The pilot was more or less 30, 30 um, teachers, all of them, teachers and researchers, and the contrasted group was much larger, was about 50. Mm -hmm. We were giving them the draft, and then they were adding comments on this, okay? And they were providing feedback on this uh, draft. And there we have the final version. <laughs> Uh, the final version that was uh, contrasted and uh, is just there for us to check, to go to it and to, fi to find real examples and illustrations. Out of the, uh, the, the components of the, of the group, uh, I must say, I, I don't have here data on the disaggregated data, but I can, I can tell you that in the teaching pilot project, there were like 40, 60. 40% men, 60% women. In the research group, I think it was 20% men, 80% women. Uh, now I'll just, my colleague Pilar will continue with the presentation, yes? Uh, with this. Okay. Thank you. Um, why is this practice an example of institutionalization? Um, as my friend and colleague uh, has mentioned, uh, it originates in the context of the Giving Roles Project and is part of the uh, Gender Equality Plan of the university. And uh, it has involved 31 faculty members. And although at the beginning they were volunteers, I have to say that um, the, all of us received some recognition of hours devoted to the work in the project. When I was listening to Marta before, I think that we all recognize themselves, ourselves, all of us, probably everybody that is here in doing a lot of voluntary work all through our lives devoted to gender equality. Um, and in this project, we insisted on everyone getting some recognition in, ter in terms of the hours devoted to the project. So this was a, a first step that we thought was very important. Um, and this is because this project, this handbook, has received support both from the uh, Gear and Rolls project, but also from the University Social Responsibility Unit. Mm -hmm. And they have been providing funds, not only support, which is, which is important, uh, we believe. Um, as my friend uh, said, it relies on hands-on experience in teaching and research. And it has been already included in the program of formative courses offered to university members in the present year and in future academic years. Um, the strengths 
I think that we were all very happy to see such a collaborative effort um, and it ended up being a highly positive experience. And I have to say that on top, I, 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 not only were people uh, working on this project that had no previous knowledge of gender um, uh, theory or gender equality, but some of the people working had very deep knowledge and had been working on gender issues for a long time. So it was a very good combination of people from different uh, stages. Okay. Um, um, all right. Uh, challenges. Um, probably the most important challenge that we have now is uh, what the sustainability will be of the whole project, not only of the handbook. Uh, once the um, Gearing Rolls project is um, finished, or if we don't have any, any further support, I will finish very quickly just saying, um, ending up with the um, um, super principles, cumulative, inclusive, innovative, and sustainable. And a lot has been said about the uh, support that uh, this project super has offered to many different projects. But I want to focus on something that is, might be a little bit different and is the all the um, important, significant and pioneering work that you have been doing on resistances. And we have people here, uh, Emanuela Lombardo, Lut, Megert, and um, also Lucy Ferguson, for example, who have worked uh, extensively on resistances. We have been using the super toolkit on resistances to structural change in, gen in gender equality in research and innovation institutions. Um, this, your work is very important. It was about the, the only few things that could be found at the beginning when we started working on resistances. And as you said before, uh, we are now extending the notion of resistances to uh, research uh, work on audiovisual studies, for example. So it has been very, very helpful, and I want you to, uh, and I want to thank you for this because it has really been, uh, it has given us the the impulse to to continue the work on resistances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this other inspiring practice of uh, institutionalization and to make it really practical, you no, know, to guide. How we, how we can do it in the different academic fields, which is really important um, with practical examples. So we look forward to, to seeing this handbook and if you can share it then online so that other universities can, can use it. And, uh, and now we have uh, 15 minutes maximum for a debate. So we look forward to your questions, comments, reflections, we've heard of so many inspiring practices. I'm sure that there will be questions. If not, I will ask one. Okay. <laughs> I give you back. Gracias. Um, there is, yes, there is already a question from the webinar side, uh, which is for Deusto and uh, about the free access uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the resources that you have been presenting. Are they available for uh, in free access for other institutions to, uh, to use them? Um, as as uh, Maria said, we are in the process of printing the guide, but it will be also available online. So, um, so far we have, um, it would be great to have it translated into English, but we have not found the funds to do it yet. So uh, we hope that, that we might be able to do it in the future, but it will be online, at least in Spanish, uh, it will be uh, online and free, uh, free access for everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, I'm Andrea Kvijan from the Central European University, and I also had a question to the Usto. I'm sorry, the, can, you can't hear me? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because the others we kind of knew from before, so it was the, the Usto. I'm, I'm following up a little bit on the chat. Is it? So what's the replicability of this for other institutions? Translation, of course, that's an, that's an obstacle, but is do you think because the process that you used, it's very interesting and I think it's very constructive for your institution, but do you think the output is, rep, uh, is usable for other institutions or you, 
the replicability is about the process. So you want us to do the same in terms of process or you should we use the, the guide? Because this is really very important also for the CEU and, and it's really the arena where it's most difficult to progress, I think for us. And so it would be interesting for us to know whether, okay, we put in the money and translate would we be able to use that or this is yours and we should do the process? Okay. okay. I will collect uh, yeah. another couple of questions and then I will continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm Marta Del Moral. I'm one of the uh, gender focal points at the Complutense University. I've got two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one, well, first of all, thank you all for the account of these very inspiring practices. My first uh, question is for Anna Belen Amil. Um, I've been also confronted with complaints by uh, female colleagues about being overloaded with uh, committee work if gender balance search committees were to be implemented in practice. So could you expand on the way you've overcome this issue at your university? And then the second comment is on, um, well, it's about uh, Maria Pilar Rodriguez and Maria Jesus Pardo um, uh, a very interesting uh, guide. Um, and I wonder how to convince our colleagues to follow the guidelines contained in your, uh, in your uh, book. Um, maybe working on incorporating this guide as a good practice in the new versions of undergraduate plans would work and how can we do this? Thank you. Hola, soy uh, Becky Tudeslia y soy una doctoranda en, de la Universidad de Complutense. Uh, y tengo una pregunta para Marta, uh, que es, ¿cuál ha sido el proceso inicial de buscar una persona para ser uh, un miembro de, de los nodos? Uh, y por otro lado, uh, ¿crees que va a ser como un cambio de la dinámica de los nodos ahora que se acaba el proyecto de, de Supera? Uh, y qué vais a hacer para, para decir, uh, bueno, para sostener ¿no? uh, las, las diferentes actividades y, um, y eso. Muchas gracias. So we give a first round of responses. Who would like to start? Maybe with Deusto we start and then... <laughs> okay, yes, sure. Well, thank you for the questions. And uh, what I can say is, yes, I, the idea of the guideline that is, 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 is very useful for us because it's being adapted to our reality. But what we have in the guidelines at the end is a, is a checklist, it's a list of indicators that can be useful to everybody, okay? And can be useful for every other institution of higher education, both in, in teaching and research. Uh, together with that, what is also interesting, and, and, and see, as you were asking, I was, I was wondering if the, if the English version that I hope will come up sometime has to be a, an unabridged, <laughs> A guide as we have right now it could be maybe an abridged one, just focusing on the most important aspects. But something that is really uh, innovative, I think, in, in our view, is the illustration, the examples, the examples from different disciplines at different stages of learning, at different stages of research, and based on what we are doing or what could be done. And I think this could be useful for everybody no matter whether you are adapting to our model or not, okay, it's, it's just part of our teaching activity and research activity. So yes, I think it can be perfectly uh, useful for, for, for all institutions. In, in terms of research, it definitely is useful for everyone because it is not based or adapted to any research model, particular model at the University of Deusto. And we have a checklist uh, divided into groups, one about the teams, the, the personal issues involved in the research teams, another more on content and the, and the research plan and everything. So it is useful for everyone. Um, and responding to your question, when we started offering it the, as, a, as a formative course for uh, professors at the university at different levels, the response has not been 
huge in terms of people mm -hmm. that were taking the, the, the uh, these courses, but in terms of uh, the depth and quality of, and, and the interest that the people that were uh, enrolled uh, showed was amazing. So they are taking it very seriously. And uh, now our challenge is to involve more people in that. But once they are involved into it, they really get into that and they are ready to work. And as, as, as Maria said before, people that never before uh, wanted to know anything about uh, gender equality, now they are taking interest, which to us is very important. Yeah, I just wanted to add something about this very, very briefly, right? And, and that is that in the case of teaching, uh, the teaching pilot uh, group, there were people who were a little bit resistant. There were people who were rather skeptical, who went there to see, okay, let's see what these feminists have to say to us, okay? Because everybody, everybody's talking about inclusive language, everybody is talking about the gender mainstreaming and all that. So what was really interesting is that those people who were really skeptical and somehow resistant to what they were going to listen to, in the end, they were fully engaged. And that was fantastic. And that was really, really good about the experience, all right? Because they, they and, and they were proposing more and more examples and they were coming up with real, real class situations in which they, real, they, they progressively realized how this gender blindness, okay, was taking place in the, in the classroom every single day. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, Anna, Anna. Thank you for the question. So how we overcame this, um, well, we, we basically dropped the 50-50 um, gender distribution of search committees requirement as a mandatory element. But um, we um, now have the article referring to that in the policy reads like this, search committees for faculty positions will strive for including 50% of women members. In search committees set up by departments with very low percentage of female faculty, all possible measures will be taken to avoid overloading female faculty with committee work, including inviting female professors from other departments to join the search committee, regrouping administrative and other workload falling on women search committees, uh, search committee members, or introducing uh, pre-screening of applicants. So basically somebody else takes care of doing a first pre-screening of 300 applications. Before approving the composition of the search committee, the pro-rector for faculty and research, which is the pro-rector in charge, will make sure that the search committee is as gender balanced as possible vis-a-vis -vis the gender composition of the department doing the search. Well done. It can be it can be adopted in, in other places. Yeah? And yeah. One word to add because maybe maybe. It's the political part, which you very tactically didn't mention, and I think we should mention, we can mention that, right? We can mention whatever. Yeah. I don't know what you want to mention. <laughs> yeah, okay. It is on. It is on, yeah, okay. So uh, basically we had to overcome democracy and uh, overstep democratic procedures here because the resistance from female, senior female faculty was so strong in the institution that it looked like the policy will fail altogether. And then we basically appealed to the very strong support of the rector and the provost to say, okay, we take it nevertheless to the next level. We amend and we take it to the next level because it was blocked in the middle because of the uh, democratic resistance of, of female faculty. So we amended, but then we also use the rector's uh, support to, to step over the head of one of the democratic steps and to just uh, pass the policy nevertheless. So that, that, and we have some colleagues who are really, really a female, senior female colleagues who are really upset about us doing that. But it was a game, it was like a decision. Do you uh, want to uh, 
now rely on the on the enlightened uh, autocrat, right? Basically, and say, okay, let him help us so that we have this policy passed and then we make sure that female faculty will be hired in those departments. And then, because these, these senior faculty were from departments that are, that are that have the fewest female faculty. So philosophy, economics, so those were the, the upset. Uh, and, and, and then in the next course, if they always hire women, then, then there's gonna be a division of burden basically. So that's maybe <laughs> for the politics of it. Eh, bueno, eh, la, a la primera pregunta creo que no soy la persona indicada, sino que quizá debería contestar María. Eh, aunque ahora le digo si quiere hablar ella, pero bueno, eh, a las no dos no se las eligió por conocimiento sobre género, porque como digo, todas no tenían, pero sí personas que tenían una cierta sensibilidad al género y hombre, había personas que sí teníamos una eh, carrera previa o formación previa, ¿no? Pero bueno, luego si ella quiere añadir algo más. Y luego... Eh, te diría que me agrada que hagas estas preguntas, que de hecho creo que me la iban a hacer alguna de las nodos también. ¿Cómo vamos a seguir? Eh, de momento nos hemos organizado, hay elecciones en un año a rectorado y por lo menos nos hemos presentado a claustro para seguir estando ahí y que se oiga de alguna manera el término igualdad en esta universidad. No sé si conseguiremos algún tipo de financiación o no, pero la idea es seguir trabajando juntas porque, como digo, se ha creado una red tan bonita que, aunque no tengamos financiación, como tampoco hemos cobrado de esta red en ese sentido, pues nos organizaremos de alguna manera, nos juntaremos y yo creo que es algo que, bueno, que espero que sea imparable. Es verdad que es difícil porque pues eh, todas estamos muy ocupadas y nos cuesta a veces eh, hacer las reuniones y nos va a faltar eh, quien, nos, quien nos convoque, pero, pero bueno, en la medida de lo posible intentaremos eh, que siga funcionando. Ya digo, pues hemos eh, intentado animar a todas las nodos a que se presenten a claustro para tener una representación y bueno, pues eh, esperemos que, que, que María siga, siga convocándonos y, y bueno, no, no sé, no sé cómo lo vamos a hacer, pero lo intentaremos. <risa> No, no Thank si you so much. Decir... And I don't know if you want to add something to, to this. Yeah, we have like one minute, so you can finish. <laughs> on the, uh, yeah, on the, on the um, selection of the different um, uh, equality uh, nodes, it was, I always said that it was a kind of a very organic kind of uh, process. So uh, it was, uh, identifying the people who have demonstrated some interest on uh, gender equality through the courses that we had uh, previously in the delega delegation for equality and also people that we know but at the same time it was also asking to the deans um, and uh, having so uh, we were very conscious that it was uh, very important that they had a good position uh, at the at the different faculties so It was different in each faculty because each faculty is a different one. So that was where the, the, the and, and I really think that was um, a, a success factor in the, in the selection as we have seen, because they are a, a group of wonderful uh, people. So <laughs> thank you so much. And of course we will keep on, 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 uh, on supporting. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much to all of you, and we thank them for sharing with us these inspiring practices. And we now have a break, and we come back at half past two. Yes. yes? Okay. Thank you.
So the sound is on. Great. Uh, thank you and welcome back to this uh, second round table. And we heard before lunch uh, about inspiring examples on implementing uh, um, gender equality plans in, in uh, academia. And now we're moving on to uh, talking about uh, how to implement and good practices, inspiring examples from uh, gender equality plans in the research and found, uh, research funding organizations. And my name is Sofia Ivarsson. I will moderate this session and I'm from the Swedish innovation agency, Vinova. So I will start by introducing our eminent panel. And for that, I will look closely at my texts here. Um, I would like to welcome Massimo Carboni, officer at Autonomous Region of Sardinia. He has a PhD in law and economics from the University of Sassari, master in Europe European planning programs, undergraduate degree in political science from the University of Cagliari, Associate uh, Researcher, Director of Regional Studies at the Center for North-South Economic Research. Professor of Contracts at University of Calgary, Department of Economics uh, at 2010 to 2015. He was appointed by the Vice President of the Autonomous Region of Sardinia in 2014 as a member of cabinet with duties concerning research, innovation policies, external investments and special affairs until 2019. At the moment, he is in charge of research and innovation at the planning office. And he has joined the International Visitor Leadership Program promoted by the US Department of State for a premier professional exchange program in 2018. Welcome. And then we have Carrie Hergarden. Uh, Carrie works as a program manager at the Dutch Research Council, NWO. She coordinates the scientific evaluation of projects in social science and humanity domain and is involved in setting up and promoting the NWO inclusive assessment initiative to optimize the evaluation process of grant applications. Throughout her career, she has always been committed to involve diverse and intersectional perspectives. Before joining uh, NWO, she worked for the European Research Council, where she was a member of the Gender Working Group. She has the master degrees in communication and gender studies. Welcome. So uh, we also have here today Jana Dvorskova. Well, I tried to rehearse before, but I didn't succeed. She's a gender expert in the technology agency of Czech Republic, where she was responsible for implementing the structural change project, GECO, a Ryzen 2020 finance project, and is involved in activities of GenderNet uh, Plus and ERANET co-found. She's also an assistant professor at the gender studies program at Charles University and a researcher at the Center for Gender and Science at the uh, Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Science and currently involved in the project UNICEFE. Welcome. And then we have Lourdes Armesto, PhD in chemistry at the University of Valladolid. I hope that is okay. <laughs> uh, specialty chemical engineering. She started her professional career as a research in the field of environmental technologies. She, in 2007, she joined the general subdirectorate and head of the in, uh, environment department being responsible for managing calls for 
R&D projects in the environment and natural resources area. In 2017, with the creation of the State Research Agency, she became the deputy head of the scientific technical uh, uh, thematic program subdivision of the AIE. A -A -E -I. Uh, being responsible for the scientific technical follow-up. Now she is the head of the Divi Division of Coordination and Evaluation of the Spanish Research Agency. And she's in charge of the scientific evaluation, selection and monitoring of all programs and calls at the agency. Welcome. So, with this presentation of our panel, I would like to start with the first question to all of you. Uh, what would be an, an inspiring example from your RFOs, gender equality plans that you would like to share with us here today? And uh, uh, I will post this question first to you, Massimo. Hello, right. Well, this is a good question, and I would like to refer to what Marcela Linkova said just this morning, especially related to institutional relevance. And if this is really important for RPOs, it even much important for RFOs. I mean, we represent the institutional level, so the one we have to design, to write, to found the research in academia. And uh, I would like to share with you what happened in Sardinia before and after Supera project. Uh, well, just before the Supera project starts, we were really, we have really a strong background in research and innovation because we had, and we have a special law for research and innovation, but we didn't really have a, a background in gender subject in research. So we started from this point. We have a really background in research, but not refer to gender. And uh, this is how we propose in Supera Project. I mean, this is, we enter in Supera Project with this situation. Then we start thinking in our institution what we can do, where we can start from, starting from this situation. And um, we adopt like a strategic approach. Okay, we, we want to talk and work with a um, structural change idea, which is the basis of the Horizon project. And we concentrate in two different aspects. The first was in the collaborative approach that you mentioned this morning. And the second one was related to the policy agenda. We thought that these those two aspects was, you know, the ones who can give us the challenges to succeed in this project. And after four years, we were right. I mean, this is were for us the two main keys for um, enhancing and for uh, reaching our goals in Super Project. We started in 2019 with the collaborative approach, including in our JEP designs. Let's say everyone. I mean, we didn't close the doors to, to anyone. Started from inside institution, but also external institution. And we take from them a lot of opportunities, a lot of suggestions, a lot of ideas for writing our, our job. So let's say that our job is now the results of many ideas, many suggestions coming from different people, different experience, and different approaches. This is, was uh, our idea. And the second one was related to the agenda. We believe that the point that we have to focus is to put to the policy agenda, the super principles. Doing that, we, we start what we, we call writing the two strategic words in our planning documents. We put the research and gender 
words inside, inside the strategic uh, documents. And starting from that, we built all the design projects and all the design uh, policies inside the different levels of uh, policy application. I just want to mention the last results that we have. We also add extra funds, uh, regional funds for founding a JEP program, program for another university, which is not Cagliari. So with founding another JEP program for University of Sassari. This is what's possible because we put in the agenda the idea of super principle. So for closing my, my points, what I would say for us, the two inspiring practices for other are uh, RFOs uh, institution, especially for research uh, for a regional level, are inclusion and uh, agenda, policy agenda. This is the, the two main keys that we, I would like to suggest to other research uh, founding institution. This is, this is all. Thank you very much, Massimo. And we will go on to hear another inspiring example. It's Armesto. Oh, thank you for the collaboration. <laughs> It's okay, yes. Eh, bueno, voy a hablar en, en castellano porque, eh, bueno, me resulta más fácil, ¿no? Eh, yo lo primero que quiero hacer es agradecer eh, al proyecto Supera todo el, el apoyo y la ayuda que ha dado a, a la Agencia Estatal de Investigación, que como ha comentado el director esta mañana en el acto de apertura, pues es una agencia muy joven que se creó hace muy poquito tiempo y entonces... Partíamos de cero cuando entramos en el, en el proyecto Supera. ¿no? Eh, y en este sentido, pues eh, yo quiero plantear quizás en cuanto a prácticas inspiradoras eh, para otras agencias eh, lo, el trabajo que hemos hecho nosotros durante estos años dentro del proyecto. ¿no? Trabajo que se ha centrado eh, en dos aspectos fundamentales, ¿no? eh, siempre referidos al aspecto de género en la investigación eh, y como os digo pues se ha centrado en dos aspectos fundamentales por una parte en incorporar dentro de nuestras propias convocatorias eh, y dentro de nuestros propios criterios de, de evaluación e incluso de, de posible desempate pues criterios eh, de igualdad de género que permitieran, pues, por ejemplo, eh, en el caso de, de las convocatorias, pues se han ampliado los plazos, eh, por ejemplo, de, de elegibilidad de, en las convocatorias de recursos humanos e incluso en algunas de proyectos eh, pues para temas de, de maternidad, paternidad, etc. Eh, también eso mismo se ha incluido dentro del, de los propios eh, formatos de currícula que, que evalúan nuestros evaluadores. Se han incorporado eh, aspectos de género no solamente en lo que es la evaluación de las propuestas, sino también en lo que es la evaluación del desarrollo de esas propuestas a lo largo durante el periodo de ejecución de las mismas, es decir, en el seguimiento científico-técnico. Eh, y bueno, pues la verdad es que esto bueno, pues, eh, pues está dando muy buenos resultados. El otro aspecto en el que más nos hemos centrado nosotros ha sido en el aspecto de formación. De formación no solamente de nosotros mismos como responsables, de, como funcionarios y personal de la Agencia Estatal de Investigación, sino también pues, de nuestros colaboradores que comentaba esta mañana el director y también eh, pues, de los evaluadores e incluso de los posibles investigadores a la hora de presentar proyectos. Y en este sentido pues, hacemos eh, varios cursos anuales dirigidos a, a distintos eh, eh, grupos o bien investigadores o evaluadores o, o incluso personal de la agencia. Hemos hecho webinarios para los investigadores para ayudarles eh, bueno, pues a incorporar eh, la perspectiva de género dentro de la propia investigación y dentro de sus propios proyectos, pero todavía queda mucho por hacer en ese aspecto. Y, y en ese sentido, pues, eh, pues bueno, creo que es algo que, que debemos continuar haciendo. Eh, también me parece interesante, eh, puesto que partíamos desde cero, como, 
como os he comentado, como he comentado al principio, eh, y bueno, pues en principio no teníamos, como, como se ha comentado antes también en la mesa redonda anterior, pues no había apoyo eh, de financiación, por ejemplo, para crear un grupo específico para, eh, para esta temática, pues lo que sí que creamos es un grupo estratégico eh, de igualdad en el que actualmente hay 13 personas y en las que participan eh, personal de las distintas unidades de, de la agencia, ¿no? Eh, es un grupo bueno, pues bastante activo en, en general y que nos da un apoyo muy importante a lo que es el staff de la, de la agencia para llevar a cabo eh, pues todos estos temas de igualdad. Muchas gracias. Por mi parte nada más. Gracias. Thank you so much. Oh, I have an assistant here. I'm grateful. Thank you so much, Lourdes. And, uh, um, and another inspiring example from Jana. You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jana Dvořáčková, as you already know, and I'm from the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic. And yeah, I, I should share my presentation. <laughs> I'm sorry for this technical uh, issue. Uh, maybe uh, just uh, to give you some uh, context uh, um, what uh, uh, concerning our organization, uh, we are a, a public nationwide research funding organizations with around about 160 employees. We support applied research and innovations in practically any fields, not just in the field of technologies. And we started to be active in gender equality, uh, uh, in promoting gender equality um, already eight years ago. Uh, but our activities uh, have uh, uh, evolved into a more complex whole thanks to the project uh, JECO. Uh, which was a structural change project uh, that uh, ended uh, last year. And uh, apart from that, we are involved in gender net plus. Um, as part of uh, this project, we uh, have implemented uh, quite uh, many uh, gender equality measures, and I won't present them in detail, but maybe just uh, list some of them. We introduced the gender dimension uh, in the research content as a criterion for evaluating proposals. Uh, uh, we also focused on gender balance uh, in research team as part of uh, uh, the ev uh, evaluation of proposals. Besides, we developed a system for motivating RFOs to launch changes for uh, gender equality. We, for example, stimulated them to apply for HR Excellence in Research Award uh, to, to implement JEP, uh, conduct gender audits, uh, monitor their gender pay gap, etc. etc. We also developed a guideline for promoting gender equality in uh, evaluation process and we developed a methodology for data collection for monitoring uh, various gender relevant processes in our funding. And uh, I would like to present in more detail our approach to introducing uh, the gender dimension in research uh, content as a criterion for evaluating research proposals. Uh, so far, uh, we have introduced it in two of our funding programs. And as for the uh, design of this criterion, it is not uh, that innovative because we decided to adapt uh, uh, the design used previously uh, by some other uh, research uh, funding organizations because from the implementation point of view, I think that this is also something that helps to negotiate the new measure uh, in your organizations and also to decrease uh, resistances uh, from researchers, let's say. So just to the design of this criterion, uh, we, uh, our 
applicants uh, have to provide an assessment of whether the gender dimension uh, is relevant to the topic they plan to research and uh, we pose them different questions they are they have to answer uh, to guide them through this process and if they uh, identify uh, any connection to sex or gender uh, they should uh, integrate in the research questions they should integrate it in the, the research questions uh, uh, research design data collection and the description of proposed uh, application and the object of evaluation is an adequate assessment of whether it is or it is not uh, relevant to integrate uh, gender uh, or sex dimension and also the quality of uh, the integration of gender dimension in the described research and uh, application. And what is also important to say that in case um, the gender dimension is considered irrelevant by the applicant uh, and the correct, correct argumentation is provided, uh, then the applicant does not lose any points for, for this criterion. So uh, because in the Czech environment, uh, this perspective is quite uh, new. Most uh, researchers and evaluators are not yet familiar with uh, the perspective, uh, we decided to use quite many uh, supportive measures. So we developed a detailed guideline uh, on the gender dimension uh, in research for both applicants and uh, evaluators. We integrated the topic in uh, info seminars for applicants and evaluators. And uh, we provided trainings uh, for uh, our staff. Uh, uh, we briefed uh, evaluation committees members uh, before the meeting, uh, we, uh, we uh, um, assisted me and my colleague as gender experts uh, in, in the evaluation committees. Uh, we also conducted an analysis of uh, the main problems in, uh, in the assessment of the relevance of the gender dimension and published an, an article. Um, for for our uh, applicants, uh, we raised awareness uh, or uh, about the topic. We had a dedicated uh, website section, for example, and uh, we also encourage uh, research teams to uh, have or include gender experts uh, uh, in their uh, research team if it is uh, if it is relevant. So we really strived for a, a complex uh, approach. Um, uh, maybe some specificity of our approach can can be uh, seen uh, uh, in the level of details that uh, of our instructions for applicants and evaluators uh, on how they should proceed, what questions uh, uh, they should answer, uh, because we really uh, strived to make uh, impossible for them to uh, provide some generic uh, questions and. Um, I think that we were uh, quite successful in this because uh, we were quite, from the analysis we conducted, uh, quite successful in uh, explaining uh, the applicants, uh, the criterion. But uh, I must say that uh, it was more problematic uh, with uh, evaluators uh, who are, of course, uh, a bit less motivated. So we will have to focus on this group more in the future. And also we will have to, uh, because like most uh, other RFOs, we uh, have focused uh, so far uh, on the proposal stage and we, we of course, to uh, reach the positive uh, impact that this uh, measure uh, uh, brings, uh, we should or we plan to focus more now on the stage of uh, the real implementation and whether, uh, on the fact whether the change dimension is or has really been fulfilled in a, a funded project. So, it would be all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jana and uh, Carrie. Let's hear an, an inspiring example from you. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I will also share my presentation, so I will have to do something technical here first before we start. Yes. There we go. So thank you for uh, having me. 
um, I work for the Dutch Research Council. So our um, core business basically is managing the assessment of uh, grant applications. And uh, part of a gender equality plan is doing an impact assessment um, of your procedures to identify uh, possible gender bias and then taking action on that. I don't know why the mic is feedback. Um, so we did such an impact assessment and, um, and it was some time ago. And it turned out that we didn't do really bad, but there was definitely an overall trend that uh, women seem to have a slightly lower chance of receiving, uh, of being awarded funding. So there was definitely uh, some room for improvement there. Um, and that's why uh, we were um, starting to develop our inclusive assessment initiative because we as a research council try to provide a level playing field for all of our applicants and an important part of that um, is this initiative um, so after doing the impact assessment we have asked experts for advice on um, how we could optimize our assessment uh, process, how we could main, uh, really offer this, this level of playing field. What could we do to make this happen? So um, we asked for advice on how we could reduce the undesired effects of unconscious bias in the assessment of grant applications. And the result of this, um, question was the development of a plan for the design of a training videos for our reviewers and assessment committee members. And really the um, uh, two videos were, were then produced and really the goal of these videos was to create awareness uh, about unconscious bias in the assessment process. So really uh, we wanted to have a positive focus on optimizing the process. Uh, there's no shame in having bias. I think everyone one does. We really wanted to give a positive and inviting uh, uh, spin on this, like how, how can we do better together? Um, so two videos were then uh, produced, one on a written assessment of application, and this is being um, sent to our external reviewers and our committee members before they start their written assessment of grant applications. And there's a second video on assessment committee meetings, uh, which focuses on uh, group dynamics and evaluating interviews and presentations, and this is being uh, sent to our um, committees before they start their assessment meeting. And we also watch it during the meeting. Um, and both videos contain uh, practical tips and tools, which they can immediately implement in their assessment. Uh, both, video fo you know, both videos focus on broadening the often uh, limited ideal image of what a good researcher or good research proposal is. Uh, and as you can maybe see from the screenshots, uh, we use an abstract style images. And this was a conscious choice because we didn't want to um, reproduce and thereby reinforce existing stereotypes. Um, yeah, having said that, I think we should uh, watch the video. Uh, together. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say, of course, this was uh, designed for our context to the assessment of grant applications, but I think a lot of the tips and tools are also applicable to other contexts. Maybe you can um, look at it from that perspective. I'm going to try and share the video now. Let's hope it works with sound and all. <laughs> the Dutch Research Council wants to advance research with both scientific and societal impact. Therefore, research needs to be conducted by people with all kinds of different experiences. A diverse range of perspectives enables innovative and creative research. 
That is why the Dutch Research Council is always on the lookout for suitable applicants and consortia to carry out this research. Our evaluators play a vital role in this quest. In this video, the Dutch Research Council calls attention to the evaluation process. Evaluators implicitly construct a frame of reference that an applicant should fit based on aspects that differ, for example, per discipline or research programme. This frame is currently rather one-sided, which results in a limiting ideal image of suitable applicants. This ideal image is implicit, but also normative. We are therefore more inclined to choose an applicant who better fits this ideal image over somebody who fits it less well. This determines who is considered to be suitable and who is not. For example, we have an ideal image about what a scientific career should look like, but it could also look like this or like this. We should keep asking ourselves, will our limited frame of reference actually lead to research with impact? further improve the assessment process, we should let ourselves be less guided by a one-sided ideal image. In order to do so, this ideal image needs to be made explicit and should be expanded during the assessment process. Now, let's consider several concrete ways of doing this. When the selection committee comes together, group dynamics are crucial. Such dynamics may bring about challenges that lead to a suboptimal assessment. Therefore, agree upon the meeting structure and code of conduct within the committee prior to the assessment. For example, agree upon the same amount of speaking time for every committee member and alternate between who speaks first. Pay attention to this throughout the entire meeting. Similar agreements should also be made for the group discussion about the proposals and applicants. Are the criteria provided by the Dutch Research Council clear for everybody? What is the weighting of each criterion and how will the criteria be interpreted and possibly compensated? Make this explicit together so that you are not subconsciously led by a one-sided ideal. images, which will result in one proposal gaining an advantage over another. Such agreements help to create a group dynamic in which everybody can be held accountable if the made agreements are deviated from. An interview or presentation can be part of the assessment process. For this, also agree on a clear structure in advance. That means discussing together which topics must be addressed and who poses which questions. Make notes and take the agreed upon criteria into account. Limit your assessment to the content provided by the applicant. Avoid taking irrelevant characteristics or informal interactions into account. Use your notes as a basis for your contribution during the committee meeting. Also, when presentations and interviews are discussed, be aware of biased language or arguments that are not relevant for the assessment. Hold each other accountable if that happens. Spend an equal amount of time on discussing each application. And don't just motivate why proposals fail to meet the criteria, but also make sure to motivate why they do meet the criteria. Finally, never discuss proposals and applicants with other committee members outside of the formal meeting. These were some concrete ways to improve the assessment process. Science with impact requires different perspectives. Let us expand our frame of reference together to make room in the assessment process for a multifaceted image of suitable applicants. That's how we work together towards innovative and creative research. So that was, um, that was it for me. I know it's a lot of information, so maybe there's a way we can share the link uh, to the web page. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Carrie. 
Uh, we have now heard uh, uh, a couple of inspiring examples on, on activities and practices in, in different RFOs, gender equality plans. And we will go uh, ahead with uh, deepening these questions like uh, what are the next important steps and, and what kind of challenges are anticipated and, 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 and of course how to make these gender equality plans sustainable. But before uh, I let the panel answer those questions, I want to open the floor to um, all of you here and also the one following us online. If you have any questions so far to the panel. Thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I have one curiosity. I would like to know if uh, is integrating a gender perspective mandatory in the uh, as a criterion for for a proposal to be positively assessed. I mean, is it possible that a proposal is scientifically very good, but it does not uh, fit the gender? Uh, criteria and still it passes. I wonder if there is a monitoring uh, of of this, or if you think if it's not in place, if you think that this would be something relevant to to introduce. Thank you. So it was a question for me, I guess. Uh, yes, uh, for everyone. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, in our case, uh, what is mandatory is uh, to provide uh, some uh, description, some assessment of whether and the researchers or the research team uh, finds uh, the gender dimension relevant uh, or irre irrelevant for their project, right? And uh, in case uh, they find it irrelevant and they are uh, able to provide uh, argumentation that is valid, that is uh, evaluated as valid by evaluators, they don't lose any points for this criterion. So I'm not sure if I answered your uh, question, but the mechanism is like uh, this, yes? And I don't know if uh, you, you want to, yeah. <laughs> Bueno, en, en nuestro caso, eh, también los propios solicitantes tienen que incorporar eh, en el formato de solicitud una serie de, tienen que contestar a una serie de preguntas relacionadas con la perspectiva de género dentro de la investigación y además está incorporado dentro del criterio de impacto eh, social y económico del, de los proyectos, por ejemplo, en este caso, ¿no? eh, que es eh, en donde está ahora mismo incorporado. Eh, también es, pero es verdad que si el resto de los criterios están muy bien, pues eh, no es un criterio exclusivo del, por el cual el proyecto no pueda seguir adelante. Como novedad, en, bueno, en las eh, eh, nuevas convocatorias que saldrán a lo largo de este año y el año que viene, en las futuras convocatorias, sí que es verdad que se ha incorporado como un criterio de desempate. Eh, el, el, la igualdad de género dentro del, bueno, pues del, por ejemplo, del equipo de investigación que presenta el proyecto o bien en el caso de recursos humanos, pues en función de que sea eh, mujer o sea hombre, ¿no? Y se ha, se ha incorporado como un eh, criterio de desempate, siempre que el resto de la calidad científica, etcétera, pues tenga el mismo valor. In our, in our case, uh, being as a research, uh, regional found that we found re we found research project, and we have got inside the, our jeep um, some uh, positive action to encourage uh, gender bias inside the the the, the course the project. So we are including inside our course some positive action in order to. Um, to get much more likely 
uh, action positive to, to gender bias. This is what we were doing actually. So we have many different calls at the Dutch Research Council and they all have similar criteria. They're all a bit different though. Uh, we do not have um, something like this in place. We are looking into how we can invite our applicants to at least think about the gender dimension, uh, but it's quite tricky to get it right, uh, especially as you mentioned, if it's uh, obligatory. Um, yeah, so we're, we're looking into it. Thank you, panel. Uh, are there any further questions? So my next question to uh, your uh, to my panel here is um, to elaborate a little bit upon what are the next important steps with your plans and your uh, activities, as you have mentioned. Please, Lourdes. Bueno, en el caso de nuestro, de la Agencia Estatal de Investigación, eh, yo creo que tenemos dos eh, objetivos eh, prioritarios. ¿no? Eh, a un futuro más cercano o, o, o más lejano. ¿no? Eh, el primero de ellos es, bueno, tenemos que eh, nuestro plan eh, de igualdad eh, está es del, 20, del 2021 a 2023 estaba fundamentalmente centrado en la igualdad, en la investigación. Eh, ahora queremos que no solamente sea, eh, esté centrado en la igualdad en la investigación, sino que también exista un plan de igualdad interno dentro de la propia agencia, eh, en el que se incorporen pues, eh, pues temas de género de, dentro de, de la propia agencia eh, y, y temas más estructurales. ¿no? Eh, ese es bueno. Es, a cierto modo a corto plazo, puesto que intentamos empezar a trabajar en ello este mismo año. Eh, más a futuro es la posible creación de una, igual, de una unidad eh, de igualdad dentro de la agencia que se eh, ocupe específicamente de estos temas, puesto que ahora bueno, pues nos ocupamos gente que tenemos otro montón de cosas que hacer eh, y entonces necesitamos un, una estructura eh, más sólida dentro de la agencia para, para dedicarse a estos temas. Eh, y luego nos parece súper importante eh, seguir eh, haciendo hincapié en la formación. Eh, comentaban antes mis compañeros, del, eh, el, al menos lo que nosotros hemos detectado, eh, no solo para los investigadores incorporar la, la dimensión de género en la propia investigación, sino los evaluadores, ¿no? para que los evaluadores sean capaces eh, de en el proceso de evaluación evaluar eh, de forma adecuada eh, esos aspectos dentro de las propuestas. Y creo que, bueno, es nuestro... No vamos a... O sea, es de manera continua vamos a continuar, eh, perdonando la, la, la reiteración, con una formación mm, fundamentalmente de evaluadores y de, y de interna de la agencia. Y yo creo que para nosotros son los dos, eh, vamos, los tres aspectos eh, más importantes que vamos a llevar a cabo a lo largo de, de los próximos dos o tres años. Thank you. And Carrie, what are the most important next steps and the anticipated challenges? Um, yeah, so for us, um... Well, it was really, uh, we, we learned along the way because we, we started off with, of course, um, what I told about creating the video and then the video was there, um, but then it has to land as well in the assessment process. So we, um, first we created a, a web page. I think the link was, uh, was already shared in the chat. Uh, so there you can see for all the tips that were given in the video, uh, background information and sources, um, and also a um, uh, a handout which uh, lists all the all the tips that are given in the video. So this is great for uh, assessment uh, committee meetings, so that you really have something on paper which uh, has everything, so you can commit together as a committee um, to do this. 
uh, and we have the same for the for the other video, by the way, about the written assessment. Um, so this was in place for externally. Everyone uh, can can visit it and 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 take a look at it. Um, but then, of course. We also have our, our colleagues, our project officers, who have to work with the, the video uh, in their um, assessment committee meetings. So we uh, designed a training uh, for them on how to uh, work with the video, how to, uh, if there would be uh, resistance, uh, how to handle that. We really wanted to give them some practical tools as well, because they are the ones standing in front of the committee and, and, and having to, to bring this into action. Uh, so we are, yeah, we designed a training for them to become, let's say, uh, a critical friend, we're, we're using this term, uh, to the committee. So they're not um, um, being involved in the content of the evaluation, but really standing uh, on the sideline and making sure the process is um, running smoothly, that we are creating this level playing field. Um, so yeah, we have the, the web page to hand out the training for our colleagues. Uh, and of course, um, this, this video is quite fresh. We started using it uh, last year, I think, and also the trainings. But now we have to monitor, of course, uh, the impact of how it's going to be uh, monitor and evaluate. Um, and that's not always easy to, to see this in, in practice because we have an application system and there, uh, gender is uh, is mentioned and of course we we follow up and see uh, what the impact will be in terms of uh, gender balance after this video but yeah as we spoke about already today uh, diversity really goes uh, beyond uh, gender there's uh, so many more factors to take into account so it's it's tricky to really monitor this right because we're of course not asking all the information in our assessment uh, in our application system. So this is something we are setting up, um, but it's it uh, takes time to to do it right. Yeah, I think that's for this project. That's that's it. Thanks. And Jana, the most important next steps and anticipated challenges. Okay. So uh... Uh, our project JECO ended a year ago, but we, of course, uh, had been uh, considering various steps uh, uh, towards its sustainability, and uh, uh, we strived uh, to integrate uh, uh, our measures uh, into our strategic documents and uh, plans, and also to secure financing for further activities, of course, because this is key. And uh, we, uh, we, for example, transferred the main measures uh, into strategic materials of our new framework uh, program, Sigma, uh, which will start uh, this uh, year and uh, under which all our future calls uh, uh, will be launched. So this should really um, lead to good sustainability of our measures. And we also secured uh, financing uh, for gender equality uh, agenda for another two years uh, under a more broadly uh, conceived national project uh, aiming to improve our services and harmonize, uh, harmonize them with international standards. So as part of this project, we, for example, uh, applied for HR Excellence in Research Award. And uh, as part uh, of this, uh, these activities that we are going to implement, uh, we decided to also uh, include uh, a gender equality plan. So uh, we will have a gender, we are now, now drafting our gender equality uh, plan, but it will be even more binding because uh, now there will be some external actors that will be uh, check it on a regular basis. So uh, this should also lead to uh, a good uh, sustainability, I believe. Uh, our job covers uh, all the mandatory process related uh, uh, requirements and recommended uh, thematic areas. Uh, but um, uh, the aim is also further systematize the agenda to really mainstream mainstream the measures into most of our calls uh, to spread the agenda among uh, more employees to make it an organic part of our uh, activities. Uh, but this job has not been approved yet, which uh, 
and I can feel some stress uh, from my management, I can say, uh, to somehow minimize its ambitions. So this is something that brings us uh, to the topic of uh, challenges. And uh, I can say that what is really positive is that recently uh, there significant developments in the field of gender equality policies have taken place in the Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, for example, we have, have a new uh, gender equality policy that uh, also uh, includes many responsibilities for research uh, funders. But uh, on the other hand, uh, this new policy is uh, not, not accompanied by any uh, financial instruments or not yet. And uh, this would not be or such a problem for the gender equality agenda itself, because uh, so far we have um, been successful in securing external funding. But uh, in fact, our organization is also regularly uh, an object of cuts in uh, public uh, money. And uh, there is a fear among our managers that uh, uh, that uh, our very visible involvement in this uh, kind of uh, activities so, um, would be perceived as uh, by some responsible actors of the state as one of the proofs that uh, uh, we have uh, maybe more money than we need, uh, simply, uh, simply said. And uh, in this sense, we, we can say that the state uh, does not act as uh, a unitary or, or, or as a uniform uh, actors. Uh, I think that uh, our management already has uh, some experience uh, that these activities uh, may be seen as something additional and uh, un unnecessary. So, so it increases their uh, resistances. And so we will see how ambitious the job will be in the end. But uh, I have also a positive ending for my story because in general, I must say uh, the position of the gender equality work uh, uh, in our organization has changed uh, dramatically because five years ago when I started to work for the technology agency of the Czech Republic, uh, um, this work was perceived more as some individual hobby than, than as, as uh, uh, work. And uh, now, uh, now I can really see that people are involved in implementing the measures that, uh, for example, the numbers of people who are um, uh, who are interested in uh, attending various trainings uh, is really very high now. For example, uh, in the case of Two last trainings I organized more than half uh, of people from our organization registered, which was a huge surprise for, for me. So uh, I'm positive about about uh, the future, and yeah, maybe I can I can end with this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jana. And uh, Massimo, you have been very creative yeah, here. Yeah, I've just, <laughs> well, we don't have much time, so I try to be short. And I was thinking that in the case of Sardinia, we work in our JEP covering two main aspects. The first one is working on uh, regional coal founding uh, research programs and we create all positive action covering the cause. And the second one is related, as uh, we said, the structural change. Uh, and we work in structural change inside the regional research institutions. We work outside the regional institution with the network, as uh, Lut, we're gonna explain much better later. But I think the most important aspect and also the challenge that we are working to is to the multiplying effect. So what we are trying to do is taking super idea, super inspiration, and to bring it to something bigger. What's, what for us is bigger are the structural found. We think the regional structural found. So what we want to do and what we are trying to do is to bring a super principle is to put them inside the structural European funds. And this is will have a really a multiplied effect. And this is what we are doing. We already included in the, our preliminary document some ideas of uh, super 
And we believe we will do a great job in the next five, six years. And I, I finish, so I keep it the audience for the questions. Thank you. And thank you very much, panel. Um, I don't know now, uh, I lost track of time, but to say that we are out of time, <laughs> my timekeeper here. So uh, we have five minutes. So if there are any uh, questions, additional questions online or here. No questions online. Uh, then I then I have a question. Were there any questions here? No. Then I have a question. Uh, let's see if you can, since uh, uh, I represent myself also an RFO. Um, what what do you think would be important uh, for RPOs to to uh, uh, implement in terms of their gender equality plans. Are there any specific things that you uh, miss today uh, from, from what you have heard that you see, well, this, you should, you should work with this or you should implement this in your gender equality plan so we can match them. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I just wanna say something really quickly, but just because I remember you know, Maria, at the beginning of the project, we have a, not a problem, but an issue because uh, RPOs and RFOs were totally different. And we had some clues to trying to match our two identities in one project. So I think it's fundamental for RPOs and RFO, RFOs try to work together. The, the, the solution will be different in different cases, but in our experience, they, we have to work together. Otherwise, we will not find the solution, even if it's not easy. And for us, it has been not easy because we found no resistance, but some problems. But finally, I think we get the, the results and very good results. Thank you. And the Supera project was a help in that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Do you have any comments? I know it's a difficult question, so. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, really sure whether I <laughs> understood your question, so that's why I'm not reacting, <laughs> sorry. Research performing organizations, as you say, I mean, we're, uh, I, I think we're both, uh, uh, working towards the same goals, but uh, it's it's an interdependence. Uh, so I was just uh, because I am very curious to know uh, what research performing organizations would would want to see in terms of implementing aspects in the gender equality plans uh, in RFOs. So that's why I turned the question the other way around, since we are representing RFOs. So. What would you say would be important? You said the, it's the collab, yeah. the collaboration, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I have anything new uh, to add to all the wonderful things that were already said today, but I think it's uh, really important to to raise a, awareness because um, I I don't think anyone will oppose more uh, diversity or it's it's very clear that we need to be more inclusive and, and diverse uh, in, in most aspects but but people need to meet first awareness and then guidance I think uh, but there's already a lot going on so that's great Yo estoy de acuerdo con, con lo que han dicho mis compañeros y creo que es eh, eh, pues la colaboración entre los distintos agentes, en este caso pues investigadores, agencias de financiación o ministerios que llevan las políticas de, eh, de investigación, creo que eso es fundamental para poder seguir adelante eh, con, esta, con este tema. ¿no? Y entonces yo creo que en ese sentido, bueno, pues el proyecto supera, en nuestro caso ha puesto... En, en más eh, eh, relación, por así decirlo, 
investigadores y agencias financiadoras y, bueno, y en nuestro caso concreto la verdad es que tenemos un apoyo muy directo de las políticas científicas por parte del Ministerio, con lo cual pues, se agradece de forma, de forma especial. ¿no? Y yo creo que la unión de, de los tres grupos y el trabajar en conjunto es fundamental para, para poder dar un, un paso más. Y si puede ser un poco más deprisa, que no como decía esta mañana nuestro director. Thank you. And you said six years. So we'll see. Thank you so much uh, to the panel and to the audience. Thanks. So I thank Massimo for uh, making a nice transition to this uh, to this short session here um, to share with you a couple of words about the Supera pilot RFO network. So as you have heard, there were two research funding organizations in Supera. They have developed their JEP, but there was also a commitment in Supera to work with research funding organizations outside the Supera Consortium. So as we set out, when the project was approved, we realized that the initial idea to set up a network of RFOs that covered the EU was already a bit outdated because other projects were working with research funding organizations at the EU level. So there is ACT, the Forgen uh, Community of Practice of RFOs, there was the GICO RFO group, there was GenderNet Plus, which was also working with RFOs. So within Supera, we decided to focus on a group of RFOs that was not yet targeted with gender equality support measures, and that's the RFOs at the regional level. We have countries represented in um, Supera, Spain and Italy that have funding organizations at the regional level. This is not the case in all the member states, but it is the case in Italy and Spain. So we decided to focus efforts towards that level of research funding organizations beyond RFOs that are situated at the national level in their countries. So, Gradually, we developed a database of contacts. We have 66 unique entries in our database of RFO people interested in gender equality who have engaged with Supera and its activities towards RFOs. We did 
webinars, but we did not only webinars, we have a special section on our website dedicated to RFOs with resources for RFOs. These 66 unique entries represent 42 organizations from 18 countries, 15 member states and two, three non-EU countries. Here you see on the map where they are, more or less, and you see why is Spain so dark? It's because of the Spanish national network, which is quite expa um, large, and that is uh, active and uh, led by the ministry and uh, supported by FECID. What we also did was a survey among the RFOs to analyze and understand their needs. And we did that in the third quarter of last year, and we received 24 complete responses from 24 institutions. One of the questions was what their situation is in terms of gender equality, why they engaged with Supera, and like three quarters of them, so three in four, have a policy in place or are already implementing measures and um, like 25% does not. We asked with which kind of support and capacity building activities they would like to engage and what they prefer. And so most preferred was were thematic webinars. So with a rather passive attitude on their side. So just at the being at the receiving end of the, of the learning and um, less, but also still appreciated, would have been mutual exchange workshops. Looking only at the organizations that do not yet have gender equality policy or JEPs in place, these clearly prefer the themat thematic webinars over the mutual exchange workshops because they felt they don't have anything to share yet. So we realized that there is still quite a way to go. Other type of types of activities they would have liked are speed dating interviews, peer review sessions, online self-learning tools and tests, which is also what we have tried to respond to with Supera, and interactive training workshops. In terms of themes, there are three main themes that stood out in their requests. So one was how to avoid bias in evaluations. Another one was how to integrate gender equality considerations in the templates for proposal applications, grant applications. And the third was how do we start with developing a JEP process-wise? So that is also what we tried to, to bring to them. And so, because Supera is coming to an end, and as we have heard before, one of the principles of Supera is sustainability. We don't want to let down our group of RFOs. So this is why Marcella Linkova is here. As she said, she will be the coordinator of um, Gender Action Plus, which is about to start. And Gender Action Plus will have a community of practice of RFOs. And so we are happy to hand over virtually <laughs> hand over our network of RFOs to uh, Gender Net Plus, Gender Action Plus, pardon. Thank you so much, Flut. And I really welcome this. It's, it's really great because it seems, I mean, it, it probably was not completely originally intended that both the policy and RFO uh, community of practice will be in one project, but it ended up that way in the call. So we will be doing this uh, in the Gender Action Plus. And with the three points that you have just uh, highlighted, th this is also the three main areas that uh, the research funding organizations that are part of the project or as full beneficiaries or associate partners also indicated as the most pressing one, gender biased in assessment, gender dimension in research, and uh, how to start developing chips. So I think that we have a lot of alignment there. This is something that the community of practice of the RFOs will be definitely focusing on. Sofia Ivarsson there is the leader of the COP. So it's, it's really also a great opportunity to have us all here like this. And I really look forward to taking, taking this further because I mean, RFOs have clearly a fundamental role in shaping 
uh, the working conditions of researchers, but also ensuring that uh, gender research and feminist scholarship get funded, that the gender dimension is integrated. So I think that we have a great opportunity to learn from what you have achieved specifically in Supera, what has been also achieved in the other projects and continue from there. So I really look forward to this and thanks. Thanks for your trust also with your colleagues in Gender Action. Plus. Thanks. And thanks for the reassurance. They are in good hands. <laughs> Thank you. This was uh, this, the end of this uh, short speech. <laughs>
uh, big accomplishments in this project. And I want to really congrat congratulate everybody for this. Um, what I want to do is maybe just offer some reflections based on the topic of this last day. So beyond ticking the box, I think this is one of the phrases I've heard the most over the past two weeks, three weeks. I'm part of another project with, with my colleagues, uh, the CASPA project, which is about feasibility of a European um, gender equality certification award system. And there, one of the recurrent topics was really, you know, this can't be a box ticking exercise. So I think many of the things that have been mentioned today here as well um, speak to this aspect in one way and another. And I think the first aspect is really that if we talk uh, beyond a box ticking exercise, uh, actually, first we need to recognize that it's good, that it's a value in itself to have a box you can tick, first of all. <laughs> So I think these formal procedures and policies, and I think uh, Marcella made this point really strong in her talk, you know, this is really an achievement and um, they create accountability and uh, transparency. And, um, you know, it's really important that we maintain this. And what can beyond ticking the box uh, mean there? I think on the one hand, we also have to recognize that these boxes uh, create visibility on the one hand, create opportunities, but they also shut out others. So they create visibility and invisibility. And I think I couldn't really agree more that there is research needed. You know, what are the impacts of those different boxes that we have? There is now a big box with which comes with money attached to it. So it's really about, you know, um, which box do we want? And uh, I think this is an ongoing uh, thing and uh, the, the research that we should really should uh, focus in. So, so we need to create evidence which boxes work better than others. But I think beyond the box also means that, you know, uh, these formal procedures are not everything. I mean, you know, there are the informal side of everything. And this is really the important part, as we know, you know, this is the gap between formal procedures and the lived reality, the practice. This is where the resistance is really settled and um, work. So I think this recognition of the value you know, of this informal side is really important because it also works both ways. It's in terms of resistance, but it's also in terms of you know, the, the, the relations, the informal uh, ties that you create, these are important for pushing for real change. And I think it's very well captured by the nice uh, design you have. So it's really about the relations behind the boxes, you know, the people that are involved. And uh, I think this is also my take home point, let's say from the ACT project, where we worked with communities of practice and had the opportunity to explore, you know, what is the community aspect really? What, what is this about? And I think uh, it really worked very well because it showed, you know, that the flexibility that is allowed by communities of practice is really fundamental because you can address and work on the immediate needs that you have uh, inside the academic world. And this is also more important because we are in precarious institutions, you know, you really want to make sure that the time that you invest uh, speaks to the needs that you have. And um, so all the good work that has been done in GNC and for gen uh, community of practice as well. I mean, this is really a big learning point, you know, this informality, this, the, the, the value of the relations, the commitment that was there made really a difference, I would say. And then of course, beyond the box in the end is uh, in, a, in a temporal sense, you know, um, so we are never finished with this. So you tick the box and you finish it. No, it's about the temporalities as uh, Marcella also mentioned, you know, we never gonna, finish when it, it sounds a bit bad, but you know, there's this ongoing uh, struggle really that, um, that is there. And I think what we need to do in a way is also you now gender equality, it's a transversal issue, which affects so many different aspects of our societies. And I think we should really take advantage of this as well. And now in terms uh, inside uh, science and universities, 
for example, when we talk about uh, a change to the academic culture, the hyper competition, you know, these are issues which speak fundamentally to gender equality as well. And I mean, we should take advantage of this and, and latch onto that, I think. And uh, from that, I also want to say that um, we will continue also um, with this through uh, the Center of Excellence, INSPIRE, which will start uh, this autumn as well, which will be coordinated by the, our research group at the Open University of Catalonia. And there are, we want to combine this active support through communities of practice. There are going to be many communities of practice working again on the issues that they really think it's important, this bottom-up processes, but combined with uh, solid research about, you know, which boxes work better and which don't. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jörg, also for, um, yeah, but for visualizing all these uh, networks uh, of, the, of the different um, sister projects and all these uh, networks that we have, that I think it's something that uh, we have something of a lot of value uh, to have. So I'm going to uh, read the message from uh, Anlo uh, Hubert. Um, as, as I said, uh, she has no voice, so uh, she couldn't um, uh, speak. But let me, let me uh, read it uh, on behalf of her. Many congratulations again to the members of the Supera Consortium for the great work you have, been, you have achieved. Today is, after all, celebrating the many successes, not dwell on resistances. Above all, thank you so much for allowing me to follow up your work as a member of your advisory board. I learned so much from that. I was then a consortium member of the Gavin Rolls project, and there have been so many bridges between these two projects, but others that have been mentioned here today, such as Casper, UNICEF, or Resistire. It seems only yesterday that we first met for a project meeting in Madrid. It is incredible that we are now together in a closing uh, conference. Apologies for not being there in person and now not even on the screen due to health issues. For me, this conference was a reminder of how a structural change is an ongoing process, but also how it is shaped by context. First, the process matters because as we heard this morning, it is not until you start implementing a JIP that you see the issues and how to refine the plan. We need to respond to different needs as they evolve. Much of the change in our institutions starts with working to improve the situation of women, and that is, of course, a necessary starting point. But gender equality is not only about women, and we must not lose sight of the structural change that is needed. As you challenge power relations, inequalities can evolve. Think, for example, of segregations. As we ensure women's representation in fields that where they were are underrepresented, such as medicine, there is a loss of status and opportunities. Segregation is maintained. It is just displaced elsewhere, such as in technology and AI recently, which not so coincidentally are now where status and opportunities are. Second, we hear from Marcela about the evolving context. She described it so appropriately as temporalities of change and how it shaped where uh, we are going. I share her optimism, uh, not that we are at the end of the, of the journey, but that we have made so much progress in the space of 20 years and that we have an ecosystem, for want of a better word, that is really enabling. The latest EU level developments are so important in that regard, as is gender equality as a fundamental European value. Marcela is right in saying that we are working to make ourselves redundant as gender equality experts, but we are not out of a job yet. The context is also that of crisis, ongoing crisis in plural, and we are indeed uh, fatigue. We can understand projects like Supera as a seed, which together with other sister projects can create a space for us. 
tools, networks, communities of practice, knowledge, policies, and policy coordination to address old and new topics. This is such a valuable enable context where we can rest, recuperate, resist in to inequalities, not change, and ultimately get results. Thank you so much to Alor. <laughs> I don't know hearing um, her voice, uh, this is really such a nice uh, thing. So um, we have, okay, we have online uh, Nicole, uh, right? Um, Nicole, um, please, uh, you have the, you have the, the floor uh, for whatever you want to say on the, okay? On the thank you, thank you, Maria. On the, uh, at about. Thank you yeah. for being uh, No problem, connected. thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, for, uh, first of all, I, I need to um, repeat what Anna Laura mentioned in her message to, uh, first of all, congratulate on, on all the, uh, the great work that, um, that has been done. Oops, can you hear me okay, Maria? Yeah, I think you're on mute, but I, I guess you can hear me okay. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Um, so yes, I think the work that has been done over the, over the past two years, um, I mean, I think that's incredible. It's a very uh, prominent and important topic and not an easy one, although we've all been talking about it for so long and we probably still will in the future. But nevertheless, I think what has been achieved uh, over those past uh, two years, I think uh, oh, I would be very proud if I would be sitting on your seats. I've been mainly been listening. I haven't been participating. Um, saying a few words here and there, uh, and of course also learning. And I've, I've also learned a lot um, of you know how important the whole topic of diversity is. Um, I'm, I'm coming from industry. I'm not sitting in the academic world. Um, I, ro I run my own business. I have a, I have a team of people. So of course my team, the, the team I have around me, I also want to make sure that diversity is part of it. Um, but what I uh, I um, I looked at the different presentations of today and what really um, struck me when I looked at Jana's presentation from Czech Republic that, you know, when she talks about uh, gender equality, it's not just words, it's really um, the whole program has been embedded in the strategy, not only in terms of it needs to be there, but I was really impressed when I read that it's also part of uh, research topics. So, you know, they, they look at every research um, proposal, is there a link with gender equality? So it goes much further than making sure there's that diversity in a team, but also you know any topic that's been looked at that there's also that link uh, with gender equality, which is very impressive. Um, so it's much more than words, but you can see it's really embedded in the strategy. Uh, what I also found uh, very interesting and very useful for myself um, is the topic that uh, Gary Harharden on um, kind of selection criteria. I found that so, so um, uh, important because it's not only about looking at the team you have and making sure everyone is treated um, equally, but it's really at the start, you know, when you build a team, when you select people, that from there you try to be as objective as possible. So that, that, that video really struck me as so useful for, for everyone. I mean, I'm actually in the middle of a, a recruitment process at my company and I found that so useful. You know, it starts from a very objective mindset and don't have that kind of ideal, I think you referred to it as one-sided ideal image. <laughs> and I could really link to that because I think that's what we all have, you know. If, um, you have the ideal image of, of the person or the team member that you want to have, but you know, there's, there's much more that the ideal and kind of diversifying there. And I think that's... Uh, a great topic to have. So I um, I enjoyed watching it and I thought Ooh, with, with the recruitment that's going on in my company, I can definitely learn from that as well in terms of how do I need to do that and don't have kind of fixed um, ideas in my head. But overall, I think um, what I've read as well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing process. It doesn't stop today. It's something that will continue and that needs to continue. Um, Anna Laura said, you know, don't focus on the on the kind of the, the resistance and the challenges. I'm sure there will be challenges in the future. That's with any kind of change that you want to um, that you want to establish. But I would say we shouldn't be scared of that. Um, you know, 
if they come the challenges, I'm sure we'll overcome and we'll, we'll step, we'll make a step forward. And I think that will be the same with this, uh, with this program as well. Even if it stops today, I'm sure it will continue. Once in a while, there will be a struggle, but overall, long term, I think we will only see progress. So, so thank you everyone for the contribution to this. ¿No? Eh, Miguel, ah, bienvenido. Eh, voy a cerrar el micrófono para que se te pueda oír a ti. Eh, adelante con tus conclusiones sobre la primera eh, mesa de universidades. Eh, thank you very much, María. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I want to apologize because I, I would like, uh, I wanted to, to attend a meeting personally in, in presence, but I have to accompany my father to the hospital, not for uh, anything serious, but uh, I have to go with, with him and it can be impossible to be in Madrid in, in the same in the same day. I think that uh, the, 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 the meeting and the, the project is very interesting, of course, that is not uh, at the end, but uh, Supera is a, a big step in the process that we need to, to change uh, and to transform. In fact, if we can get a, a conclusion, I would say that uh, supera means superation because in some way we are we overcome many of the obstacles, many of the resistances, many of the elements of the context of inequality, and we uh, have uh, developed uh, policies and instruments to uh, implement equality and to advance in, in this sense. Uh, I wanted to to. Uh, highlight uh, two big uh, elements, uh, what had uh, been done and how it uh, has been done. If we see what some of the elements, of course, that would have uh, done uh, many other things, but if we see uh, what, have, what had been done, we see that uh, we have very good example of, of this transformation. Uh, for example, as the Central European University presented, increasing the number of women in the different uh, position in the um, university. Uh, but also uh, it has been developed uh, mechanisms to guarantee implementation of the gender equality plans and the implication of university. For example, the gender mainstreaming mechanisms uh, monitoring the structure that has been presented uh, by the University of Cagliari and University of Coimbra, the red, the nodos de igualdad de la eh, University of Madrid, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, or for example, creating a, a handbook for the integration of gender perspective in teaching and research by the University of uh, Deusto. I think that they are very good example, not only of uh, initiatives, but also to change the, the own dynamics of the university and try to, to help to transform the uh, situation within the university, but at the same time, uh, getting some uh, uh, transcendence outside of the university in, free in the um, in society. But the second question is how it has been done. And I think that is very significant that it has been with uh, a, a participation of uh, the university, different uh, statements on position and transversality. I think that is a, a different way to, to develop things and to get this implication of the university is very important because at the same time, uh, the process has followed the superior core principles, cumulativeness, innovation, inclusiveness, and sustainability. And it think, I think that uh, considering these elements, uh, the value of the results are more important. Of course, that we have um, found some resistance but uh, they are part of the process. I think that is not something strange to the, to the process because what we are doing is not only changing the university, we are changing uni uh, society with, uh, from the university. So these kind of resistances are similar as we see in society when we try to develop 
uh, any other um, policy, any other initiative regarding to equality. And uh, just to, to finish my, my words, I think that all what has been done has been done to stay through institutional analysisation because it's not only um, uh, some project that is going to finish, but we have uh, we, we have left as uh, some has been mentioned. We have left seeds that is going to uh, help to continue this process of transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miguel, uh, for uh, for your words. And uh, now we have the privilege of having our uh, partner evaluation here. Uh, also, he has been following the the, the comments and the the, uh, the questions uh, and answers in the chat online. So. Um, and, and, and I can tell you, he knows a lot about all of us. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yes, so uh, Maxime, uh, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. I, I won't share uh, publicly the dirty laundry, right? <laughs> um, but nevertheless, you, you, you may have noticed during uh, over this day uh, that the stories we have been told about, it's we are not only about um, data management system, proper data management system, about uh, um, building uh, gender mainstreaming support structure, about adopting gender sensitive uh, communication, uh, or about building efficient network, uh, both regional, national, of uh, uh, research funding organization. All of that obviously is to the credit of the project, uh, but all of that will be insufficient to qualify what this community has been achieving, I think. And uh, uh, beyond the different principles that we have mentioned and that uh, uh, Miguel Lorente just recalled uh, around which this project has, has been built, there was also a shared um, idea, which is that uh, designing, adopting, and implementing gender equality plan is a political process. That it is about internal, but also sometimes external political affairs, and that it takes what policy making and politics usually takes, which is strategically framing uh, the issues at stake so that they get to the right people and to the right process. Understanding how decisions are actually being made, not only officially, but also unofficially. Uh, building alliances, finding your proper allies, uh, adapting to situations uh, and to political change, to internal political change. Um, and also understanding that advancing gender equality in research and academic organization and research funding organization is part of the broader societal agenda uh, of building a model of society that we would like uh, to happen. And that this requires to be extremely uh, sharp in the argument and cautious at the same time in the arguments that you use. Um, and uh, yeah internally politically active. And maybe it was linked to the fact that a few political scientists were involved <laughs> in the project design, uh, more than usually maybe, uh, but not only. I think that all partners, whatever their status, uh, whatever their uh, issue coverage, uh, whatever their dimension and mission statement, um, endorse the idea that this is a political process. And I think that the achievement of this project have been proportional to their capacity to deliver that uh, and, uh, and, and, and really to fight <laughs> for those issues to be put on the top agenda, to be uh, embedded into strategic document and yes, to be institutionalized in many ways. And uh, for the evaluating partner, it has been a fascinating journey uh, because it has not been an easy one. 
<laughs> with a lot of political change, uh, a lot of situation to navigate, COVID inclu including, inclusive, um, and also with many opportunities to test this premise that this is a political process, like building bottom-up change when top-down ch top -down change was no longer so much possible. Uh, that does not prove to be as efficient, but this is a mitigation measure that proved to uh, to carry out a, a certain to deliver a certain number of results, uh, adapting to uh, being kicked out from a country as a university, which basically never happened. Uh, notably due to uh, the Central European University having a long commitment on gender issues and so being framed as a third of um, gender ideology uh, in uh, 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 Christian Hungary. Um, or uh, adapting also to the multi-level uh, dimension of governance in uh, quasi-federal Spain or, or over federal Spain, I would say, uh, or in uh, the region of Sardinia with a specific stages and uh, specific, uh, specific competencies uh, uh, in dealing with uh, research uh, activities, but also with uh, uh, entangled um, policy context at the uh, Spanish Agency <laughs> of Research, uh, uh, linked to uh, the ministry uh, uh, agenda and to the agenda also on gender equality of the state administration in Spain, one of the most progressive country, but also one where uh, it has been some time becoming difficult to navigate the gender equality structure uh, because it is multi-layered, very diverse, and uh, sometimes a little bit overlapping. Uh, so really, it has been all about politics. Uh, and I think that in the context of uh, Horizon Europe, which in, just indicates that the time uh, is running out for adopting gender equality plans that are effective, that passions of everyone, us involved, is running out, <laughs> and that results are to be delivered, um, this is kind of a precondition for achieving uh, sustainability and going far beyond the ticking the box exercise. But if that was not enough, this Horizon Europe framework, which is putting uh, the things very clearly, um, we also are reminded that uh, gender issues have become, have become uh, one of the major divides uh, of our time, to the point that uh, some can feel even emboldened to the point of uh, launching a war on their neighbor, also on the basis of divergent interpretation of gender issues and gender rights and of the model of societies that it convey. Um, in March of 2019, I was at the University uh, Simon Kuznev of Kharkiv in Eastern Ukraine, 60 kilometers of the Russian border, still 60 kilometers of the Russian border today. Uh, that uh, where uh, they were carrying out a project on uh, adopting a gender equality plan and they were quite successful in doing that and they were pretty innovative also in doing that coupling that with uh, labs and uh, uh, different uh, techniques of participation because people there understood it was political understood that it was about a model of society in the making and were feeling emboldened and encouraged in a positive and constructive way uh, to go further and to not being deterred by those who were uh, raising the flag of gender ideology to uh, dismiss their claim uh, to a gender equality plan. So I think that this terrible and tragic context should remind us that we should also feel emboldened and encouraged in a constructive and positive way, not to be deterred by bullies of any kind, neither at institutional or organizational level, nor at domestic level, nor at European level, and uh, that we should deliver the model of society we want through research innovation organization also, and that's it. <laughs> this is what we have to do, and uh, and uh, and there is no no uh, sustainable nor legitimate discourse to oppose it. Actually, L less than ever. Thank you very much, and congratulations.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maxime. And, and I think we have a, a wonderful um, uh, concluding remarks or uh, closing uh, the closing event. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, really all your words. I think it's, um, they, they have been really pointing, uh, pointing to the two very important things. Um, I, I would just uh, uh, say before uh, we, we close that um, something that also it was uh, uh, mentioned, I mean, beyond the idea of the different networks and how we can um, rely on these networks that we uh, have, is this idea that uh, with a super, uh, the um, really fabulous uh, super uh, uh, journey, for example, something that was said uh, at the end of the RFO uh, roundtable, that it makes the uh, may, it's it is important for both of them is the idea that in Supra we have learned very much from each other, from the RPOs of the universities and the two RFOs. Uh, we started uh, some time. We we really thought that we needed to split some of the things that we uh, did, but we have at the end of the day we have worked together much more than uh, than uh, even it was expected, and I think we have done uh, a really uh, good job. Um, I just, I, I mean, really, really, it's uh, uh, late already, um, and I just want to thank you very much, all uh, of uh, you, um, again, the ones being here, the ones uh, being online, but of course, I would like to, again, thank you very much, all the, I mean, the consortium, our partners, and not only our partners and the teams that we have been here working, but also uh, how we have been working, extending in our institutions. And in this sense, I would like uh, to thank, especially in this case, the uh, network of gender equality notes at the Complutense University as representing uh, all the things that we have been doing in the institutions from the partner, uh, uh, partner uh, institutions. Uh, of course, I would like to thank very much to our international advisory uh, board uh, who have been with us, accompanying uh, uh, us. And of course, uh, thank you again to all the people uh, who have accepted our uh, invitation um, to share with us. Uh, and this uh, means uh, an, uh, Athanasia uh, Mungo from the, from the uh, gender sector in the European Commission, of course, Marcela, Thank you so much for uh, being here, but also uh, um, Maria Pando and uh, Pilar Rodriguez from Getting Roles, uh, Jana Zakova for, from, uh, from uh, GECO, and of course, Kari uh, from uh, the Netherlands uh, Research Agency and all the people who have been uh, uh, working uh, with us and, and working on, on, and wanting to, to share. And of course, I don't want to, uh, to finish this without Thank you, uh, thanking very, 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 very much. Uh, I did the team that uh, have been working like crazy for this, and uh, especially Fa Paula de Dios, Lorena Bravo. Pajares, Lidia, <laughs> Lidia González, and uh, also Oninsa Sagredo from uh, the, the quality note from in medicine who has been helping and supporting us. Thank you so much. You have done a really great job and, and thank you all of you for being here. Okay, thank you. Thank you.